Hi, Michael Wesley, the Dean of the College of Asian Pacific. And I'm really excited uh, that, I, I woke up this morning really excited that this was the 18th of August because I've been looking forward to this day for a very long time. Um, the genesis of this day was, um, I believe here, in, uh, we were at breakfast one morning and we started talking about um, some of the great benefits of the ANU. And, you know, some of the great benefits of the ANU is that we have remarkable breadth and depth of expertise, and yet we're a relatively small institution, both in numbers and in physical size. And we started talking over breakfast about, wouldn't it be great if we were to, to take advantage of those two great benefits um, and start to talk to each other about our research and perhaps foster some collaborations across college lines. And of course, one of the great barriers to doing that is simply information. Um, we're aware that there are people in other colleges and that they're likely to be doing great stuff. We often hear about them when they win prestigious awards and do wonderful things and speak on the television and the radio. But we don't really have a systematic way of finding out what, it, what each other does and what we have expertise in. And so the idea of the college showcases came up. Days that were, um, or half days, uh, that would allow people from other colleges to come along and listen to uh, the research expertise of, of people in each of our colleges. So I was really happy and uh, excited uh, that uh, the other deans allowed CAP to go first. So we've got a really interesting program uh, designed for you this afternoon. Um, we've uh, decided to put on a number of discussions around particular research themes within the College of Asia and the Pacific. Um, security, then sustainability and resilience, culture and identity, development, and finally, governance. And we've asked two or three people from across CAP to come along and talk about their research in these particular areas. So we're going to start off with security, because here in CAP we realise that uh, the more scared people are, the more business we have. Um, and so, uh, so it's good to put people uh, on their wits uh, first off. What we're going to do is we're going to ask each of our presenters to speak for about three minutes or so, uh, and then there'll be time for the audience to engage in discussion and ask questions. Before I, um, I ask the first of our speakers to come up, um, I will let you know that uh, uh, when we're outside having a cup of coffee or having something to eat over lunch, uh, there are some posters up there. We've uh, invited our PhD students to um, uh, put up some of their work on posters. So please do have a stroll around and have a look at those posters. Um, there may be something there of interest to you as well. So, to the theme of security. Um, unfortunately, Amy King, our third speaker, is unwell today. So we've got two presenters on security, um, uh, Roger Bradbury from the National Security College and Cecilia Jacob from the Bell School. So without further ado, Rog, if you would come up and tell us about sleepwalking to war. Thank you. Uh, do I need to be mic'd up? Yeah, did you want to have a microphone? Okay, yeah, I'll just take that. Did you want to control the slides? Okay. He's just right left. Right yeah, good. It's not too complex, I hope. Um, right, left. We all have to Yeah. Didn't work. So, if you want to hit me the next slide, please. Sure. Okay. Um, sleepwalking to war. This is a piece of work that I'm doing with uh, Chris Barry from uh, uh, Strategic, uh, Strategic and Defence Studies Centre at CSC. Uh, Chris, you might. Some of you might know he's a former, former Chief of Defence Force and uh, he's a really good bloke to work, work with because he knows how to scare people and, dr and drum up business for the college. Uh, and I'm also, we're also doing this work with uh, uh, a, a, a young scholar over in computer, uh, the College of Engineering and Computer Science, Dimitri Bushnev. Uh, now, our, our problem is that we're looking at is why why do countries sometimes, or 
ensembles of countries, why do they sometimes sleepwalking the war? We know from the First World War situation that this, is, uh, that this appears to be what happened. Why do they do things that are inimical to their long-term own interests? And we decided to have a look at this. This history is very important, but um, there's nothing like modelling and simulation to look at a larger, a larger universe of possibilities. History has a very thin stream of what happened. Looking at, looking at modelling and simulation about what states might do gives you a, gives you a larger field to look at, to look at the problem uh, in, a, in a slightly different way. So we, looked at, so we take both together. And what we did <coughs> is we built a thing called an agent-based model of an ensemble of states. These, these, these nation states are autonomous in the model. They allow, they can have, um, they can have behaviours, they can have strategies. They can change their strategies over time based on whether things are going well for them, and they can, and also they can copy from, they can copy what other states do. They can watch what, are, what seems to work for other states and, and, and do that. In other words, they develop their policies and strategies based on their past experience and what appears to be happening around them. And we let them, and we let them interact. We give them, we give them uh, uh, an urge to grow, to grow in wealth. We allow them to compete with other states, and we allow them to cooperate with other states. In the limit, competition becomes war. In the limit, uh, cooperation becomes peace. So they live in the sort of world that we know states states live in. Um, and we look at particularly two particular settings for their strategy: their hawkishness and how, how likely they are to get the war, and their, or how, their, how forward leaning they are, and their risk aversion. How much they calculate the costs and benefits of war. So let's look at what happens. Can we have the next slide, please? Uh, okay, so when countries believe that war is the cost of another, another way of looking at that is when countries have forgotten the cost, the real costs of war, this is, this, is what, this is what happens. The, uh, their willingness to resort to war, I think we may have missed a, if we can go back one, we may have missed a picture. Three, two, keep going, four, five, here we go, good. This is what happens with an ensemble of states when, they, when they've forgotten the cost of war. What happens very quickly as they change their strategies in relation as they watch what other states are doing and so forth, over time, their hawkishness grows very quickly but it, and it stays constant. And their risk aversion drops very low and it stays constant. Um, and these, when you're, in, when you're in these positions, they're very resistant to change. And some people would say that there are parts of the world today that are, that are like that. They're highly hawkish and, they've, and, the, and they're not very risk averse. They've forgotten the costs of war. Okay, so we drilled down on this and looked at, next slide please, and looked at what happens between pairs of states to see whether we can find a de-escalation path away from, that, away from that setting. And what we did was compute the likelihoods for each point in a space, which, and each point in the space uh, is the strategy of country one versus the strategy of country two. And to see whether there are paths for them to get out of this, get out of this, um, you see, this trap. So let's have a look. Uh, we coloured the space for war, peace, and standoff. So these are, if you can have the next slide, these, this, is the sort of, this is the sort of strategy space countries find themselves in. Red means they're very likely, the probability of them going to war is very high. Uh, and here, when hawkishness, when risk aversion is very low, the bar at the top, when risk aversion is very low, there's almost nowhere a state can be which doesn't lead, which doesn't lead its next step to be, to be war. Move on, and we'll finish this very quickly, and I'll show you if we, if we change the risk aversion level a little bit, we suddenly start to see that green is, green is a peaceful domain. Even if, you're up in, even if you find yourself up in the warlike domain, you can make a few steps, and you can find somewhere where there is a peaceful solution to your, to your strategic dilemma. So there starts to be an opening up of the, of the strategic option space, so that, so that states don't have to go to war, once risk aversion, once you start to calculate the costs of war a little better. So let's take it to the next one. And suddenly, we're starting to see the chances of war getting pushed to the perimeter as risk aversion goes higher and higher. And in fact, at the top, 
a new domain of just standoff, which is like the Cold War. They're, they're both highly, the, the countries are both highly hawkish, but they calculate the risks of war so much that they stand off. So that's, um, that's also a stable point. And if we go to the final one, we start to get into a region when risk aversion is, is high, countries can find a place which is peaceful, and, or, and even when their hawkishness is very high, that they're still calculating the cost of, of uh, Armageddon, they can find a standoff place. In other words, they can find a position in that space, which is an option space for all, of all your strategies. They can find a position in there which allows you to do the risk work. Roger, thanks very much. <laughs> and that is it. Okay. okay. Next we have Cecilia Jacob, who's going to talk to us about human protection and UN reform in a changing global order. Thank you. Well, I don't, I don't know if I still have my extra minute now. I'm taking it. Very quick. Okay. I'll take yeah, my first one. Do you want to say that? I might sit there somewhere. Oh, maybe this point. Um, okay. So, having entered on peace, I'm going to um, try and continue with that theme from a different angle. So, my research is addressing United Nations conflict management reform and the protection of populations in armed conflict and also mass atrocities. Uh, so, what's the challenge? Um, today, there are 50 armed conflicts worldwide, 65 million people displaced, possibly, mostly by armed conflict. Some hundred million people are in need of humanitarian assistance. So we've got a massive problem on our hands. Uh, so what I argue is that the challenge is huge, but this um, report card hides a lot of important progress that's taking place uh, among international organisations and states in response to human suffering that's needed to strengthen international architecture for managing and resolving violent uh, the past few decades has witnessed the emergence of what I'm calling in my research the International Human Protection Order, which is characterised by distinctive features in terms of the normative framework that underpins increasingly robust and assertive protection practices in conflicts, uh, such as in South Sudan, Central African Republic and the Democratic Republic of Congo. So my research tells a slightly different story about the challenges of developing effective international human protection norms and architecture than is conveyed through uh, accounts of international hypocrisy and failure. Um, these are very real shortcomings of the international community. However, through interviews and with, uh, with international policymakers and case study research on local conflicts, I'm tracing uh, the implementation of human protection norms across uh, the UN system to show how the implementation process itself is generative of uh, significant institutional reform and how it's also creating new avenues to strengthen international moral, legal and political accountability. Uh, it traces the channels through which the UN is responsive to successes and failures in protecting local populations and it shows that while this is still constrained by the heavy weight of state interest and geopolitics, uh, the normative agendas are highly instrumental in shaping international practice and catalyzing institutional reform that is constitutive of the broader evolution in international order. Um, understanding the origins, process and direction of UN conflict management reform is significant for countries like Australia that consider the global rules-based order uh, is vital to its interest in global stability, peace and security. Uh, I don't have the answers to human suffering in um, conflict and I believe that this ultimately still rests with the willingness of states to find political solutions to armed um, conflict. However, my research does show the importance of the creativity of diplomats and international policy makers to reconceptualise norms of human protection, linking them to concepts such as justice, human rights and the resilience of society. And finally, my research shows that addressing big security problems in international relations requires clear strategies for diplomatic negotiations, for advocacy, uh, and for translating higher order principles into the operational guidance for those who are on the front line. So this work requires creativity and imagining possibilities for global justice in places where they haven't existed before. And I hope I'll stick to my three minutes for Q&A. Okay. Thanks, Cecilia. <laughs> Come and join me down the front. Now here we have an opportunity to 
ask questions and engage in discussion. Does anyone in the audience have a question? Matt. I've got a two-part question for uh, Professor Roger Bagger. First is, is Donald Trump going to kill us all? Ah. <laughs> but the second one, a more serious question, well, maybe less serious, but I'll ask it too. Um, I'm having trouble with the idea of a risk aversion because it seems like a recursive concept where it's already an evaluation, but you're using it as a variable. So presumably, it's, it's part of the calculate. You're, you're including it to calculate what the risk actually is, and then somebody is looking at that and then calibrating their sense of what the risk is based on <coughs> that. You see what I'm saying? It almost seems like it's both plugged in and then read out from. Yeah, don't, uh, if we could go back a couple of slides, I can show whether Donald Trump is going to wipe us out. Um, that one, yes, please. Um, that's, a, that's a really good question. Don't, go, don't overthink this because these are, these are very high level abstract variables we're playing with. Um, and what we're seeing, we're seeing um, hawkishness sweeping up nationalism and uh, as, as, a, as, as, as a process in states that has a high emotional content, wrap, you know, sabre rattling, wrap yourself in the flag, all that sort of rubbish, which we're starting to see in a lot of countries around the world. And we're seeing, with, and, and we're seeing that as a, as, a, as a variable that's strongly influenced from outside um, because you can't be seen to be less hawkish in some, in some situations than, than your hawkish neighbour. Uh, we're seeing risk aversion as more, a, more an internal calculus where, as you say, you calculate the risk and then you calculate the risk of whether you'll take the risk. Um, and we're seeing that as a, as a thing that's a, a more rational process and has, to, and has to do with internal policy settings, and it has to do with um, policy makers talking to and talking the political class down, down a notch when they're, getting, when they're getting a little bit hot under the collar. So we're seeing one as a, a rational thing to some extent, and one as a more irrational thing. Um, so it's, uh, so it's, it's sort of, it's sort of uh, an, interesting, uh, an interesting issue. And if you look at this one, here you've got. A, let's just say that both, both. Uh, let's call let's call this the U.S. country one, and country two called Korea, for example. Uh, just for example, North Korea. Um, and you can see that uh, if risk aversion is is low, and this is uniformly low for both. So we don't. It's 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 not the most satisfactory graph to describe what what you're talking about. Is that even when it's even when it's high, you can find one country at least can find slices through there which allow it to, to move. If you think of this as a space, an option space, and if you think that policy gets made in increments, it's very hard for the inertia of a, of a bureaucracy to make a 180 degree turn in policy in one go. But they make steps, they change their policy in steps. And the problem in the First World War was that they were in that whole red domain, no matter what policy steps they made, they, were still, they still couldn't go anywhere. But here, there are steps you can take, uh, which aren't small, relatively small steps across this space, um, that you can get, get you away from the war up to standoff, or even, in, or even into peace. Now, that's a, those, those policy options are available, whether they're going to be taken up by Mr. Trump or, or KJU is, a, is, a, is a another issue. Um, but, but I think the important thing we're, that we think we're showing is that, is that that space, it's not a uniform red landscape. Uh, there is, if you start to calculate the, the, the risks, the real risks, you've got some, you've got some opportunity to, to walk back. Thanks. Chief. Yeah, yeah, good point. Um, Chris, Chris and I came to this because Chris was really concerned that we've had this unparalleled long pe period of relative peace in the world uh, through the Cold War where we had standoff and then through bad wars but not involving the whole populace that, that both the population 
and the elite have forgotten about war. They've forgotten about people going off to war and coming back dead in, in huge numbers. And so, so, he, so we're trying to see how, how is it that you start, if you've forgotten the real cost of war, if your risk aversion has changed uh, to, uh, to low risk aversion because you don't think war is that bad, then how do you, get a, how do you make, make a more realistic assessment? Part of it is through a free and democratic process where, where people start to remember, where people start to tell their, their elected leaders. And part of it, I think, is for, the, is for the, the memory inside the policy apparatus to somehow assert itself with the political class who have short-term memories, that it didn't work so well in Iraq, it didn't work so well in Vietnam, it didn't work so well in, half, in three or four other places, that we really should start to think what the costs are, and that should and that should penetrate into the in the in your consciousness when you're making decisions about whether to go to war or not. Um, I don't think Mr. Trump uh, takes uh, has that view about you know. I don't think he's that risk averse. Uh, I, uh, I I think he's sort of in a in a in a bad place. Uh, and KJU, I don't think it, I think is similar. They they live in a bubble. They don't see. They don't see. Um, they don't see the awful costs, the real costs of, of, of major warfare. And we're talking about major warfare here, not just skirmishes. Yeah. Remember, Tom. after in the first world war, when it broke out, the leaders on both sides were so confident they said the troops would be home by Christmas. Unbelievable. And yet, uh, one one little factoid that I give to my students uh, in uh, when we're talking when we're talking about how politicians and policymakers should be very, very careful with these things. This is in the Battle of the Somme, 30, 30 kilometer front, the British lost 20,000 people dead in the first day. And that whole Battle of the Somme lost, had one million casualties. Unbelievable. And that was in 1918, 1917. And that was, that was the troops coming home for Christmas. They came home all right in car sets. So, um, how do you test your idea in a way that will convince somebody outside academia? Yes, good point. And how do you envisage applying this in the real world? Um, so we can show we're providing value. I think we can. I think we can map real situations in the in the historical past on, onto some of these onto some of these maps where. This is this is roughly this is the, the qualitative place where country A versus country B work was in before the such and such war, and if they diverted, this is where they moved to, and this is how they were able to get out. I think we can show that, but that's a that's a, a second approach. And how will this be applied in practice? Um, to I think the thing if it just brings home the message that you need to. That risk aversion, properly calculated risk aversion, is one of is one of the things you've got in your kit bag to help you make better policy. And if you if you don't do that calculus properly, you, you can make horrendous mistakes. And how we how we convince how we convince the policymakers of that? Yeah, that's a, a good question. And what's your plan for doing that? Uh, so I'm just a simple academic. Well, I, I don't try and convince anyone. I, I just try and say this is the way it is. <coughs> I put it to you that that approach is no longer acceptable. Mm. That, um, we're not here just to theorise about things. We're here to deliver value to the community that's paying for this. Yeah, so I you need to think about how to apply yeah. this. No, I think, I think the way to do it is through, is through engaging policymakers and showing them this stuff. That's one way. But the most important thing is to, is to establish the reality of this and put it out there. Uh, there's nothing like there's nothing like true true things, new true things being out there in the in the environment to help to help debate. Well, that hasn't worked with climate change. <laughs> That's an unfair response. <laughs> we, we've got that panel. <laughs> That's coming up. <laughs> Raga. He's ruining it for me. <laughs> Thanks very much for your excellent presentations. I bring a an economist perspective into what you have said. Uh, one
is, uh, I'll, and I'll raise two points. Uh, the first is that, uh, uh, first, first is a question of terminology. For an economist, uncertainty is different from risk. This is uh, Frank Knight going back all the way to the 1930s. Yeah. Uh, uh, you said for computing risk, uh, risk conversion or risk or whatever. Now, if you do that, then uh, the Knightian definition is that risk cannot be quantified. What can be quantified is uncertainty. And you can attach probabilities to different states of the world and use that to compute the the possibility of something happening. So I, I thought I, I would raise that point with you that economists would uh, have that issue uh, with, this, with this presentation. Uh, and the second point is that there is a, the uh, risk aversion state that you have, low or high, is just given. It is not evolving. And uh, it's not a dynamic now, and it doesn't change over time. The states are either risk averse or they are not risk averse. And different states of the world lead to uh, the conflict or cold war, or different combinations lead to uh, conflict or cold war or peace. Whereas in the 80s, I don't know whether you are uh, aware of this literature, there was a big literature in economics called um, catastrophe theory, mm -hmm. uh, which it actually- is pure mathematics. Uh, yeah, it is, yeah, it is a mathematical theory but which was modeling the possibility of falling into deep recession. Uh, and uh, that uh, catastrophe was defined as getting into a deep recession. Mm. And I think that maybe, uh, I don't know uh, the, the details of your work, but maybe um, there is some lesson to be learned from catastrophe theory for the kind of work that you are doing. So maybe, yeah. maybe The risk aversion isn't uh, isn't a binary. It's it's a continuous value. So is hawkishness. Um, and the uh, and what we're actually doing, as you rightly point out, is we're measuring likelihood in that space. Every point is a is a is a likelihood of uh, is is the point of risk. Every point in that space is the is this value of risk aversion versus this value of this this value of hawkishness, and from that. And the computed um, or the estimated likelihood of some outcome uh, as probable. So that's uh, yeah. so I'm using risk in a in a in a common parlance, not in a not in a bit technical in a, in a bit technical way. I like the idea of catastrophe theory. I think in two dimensions might capture perhaps a third poking through of of war or something. You could imagine that some of those some of those structures we put up would look like fold catastrophes. Uh, driven by two dimensions with a, with a fold in it. Uh, I, I, I could see that uh, coming out quite nicely. That would be, uh, yeah, uh, that would be sort of an analytical solution where we're trying a, uh, you know, a, 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 a computed simulation, simulation but, I, but I could see that catastrophe theory would, would go there. We could, also, we could also see longer processes. We could also see state limit cycles. Terence. Uh, I'm interested in this area. Um, normal acuteness, um, it's a topic I'm really interested in, and my question falls slightly beyond the other parameters of your presentation, which I'm interested in hearing your thoughts. First and foremost, I was curious as to which community you thought that the acuity of norms was most important within. So is it the acuity of norms across others, or is it the acuity of norms across political elites, or is it the acuity of norms across uh, diplomats, perhaps? Yeah, thank you for that question. So my interest in norms actually came from my interest in atrocity prevention uh, and looking at the, you know, when states commit atrocities at a very local level, that this language in the norm diffusion literature was assuming that norms would somehow diffuse from the international level down to the state level and become internalised by states. And the longer I looked at that, I started to get frustrated with these frameworks, thinking security sectors, rule of law institutions, the kinds of institutions within the state that you need to reform in order to achieve atrocity prevention goals. 
were not going to internalise these norms because the way they were articulated at the international level uh, really blocked an, a translation of what you know, an international norm of atrocity prevention might look <coughs> like in terms of security sector reform uh, or very localised practices. So I'm trying to look away from the norm diffusion model and I'm playing around with socio-legal approaches to looking at how do norms practice in function to affect institutional reform. So I'm looking at the way states, international policy makers, so bureaucrats within the UN obviously is a focal point for uh, these human protection standards, have been very creative in reconceptualizing norms to be able to target a different audience, if that makes sense. So I've been, still early days, but tracing progress through the, the Human Rights Council, for example, where they've taken the language of human protection norms, responsibility to protect, and they've said, what does this mean for the Human Rights Council? Well, this means that we're incredibly effective in doing early warning. All the work that we do on human rights um, protection is actually, it's going to capture atrocity prevention much better than the toolkits and frameworks that we have. And so you have these institutional sites throughout the UN <coughs> that are changing their language and their concepts according to where they are. So it's variation within the institution. And what I'm finding very interesting is the way that this is opening up new ways of thinking about international accountability, uh, accountability of the international institutions, the multilateral organisations, working methods of the Security Council and so on, uh, accountability of states. Do they have to mainstream and report to the international community on their practices? And what could this actually mean for accountability within the states, specific agencies within the states? So I'm playing around with these concepts to kind of move past this norm diffusion models, which I find the international relations focus on socialization and the diffusion process doesn't sit, doesn't incorporate the legal perspectives, whereas a legal perspective looking at the process of legalization, likewise is not capturing the social element of how these norms based on legal principles and moral principles actually function in practice. And so I'm trying to bring in this legal perspective, this socio-legal perspective, to try and push it out a bit further. So would you still argue that the laws on their own fit the, the international laws and the enforcement mechanisms aren't strong? Will only get traction if they're ever enforced by the limited uh, changes? Yeah, and so by looking at international human protection norms that may have a legal backing, but are not laws per se, they're actually norms, we find ourselves in that difficult position where you don't have strong accountability um, mechanisms for it. So how can we be creative in thinking of holding states and actors to account on the norms that they're advocating without blocking them into some kind of tough compliance mechanism which might have the opposite effect? Sure. I was just going to bring in the um, One of the criticisms of um, humanitarian responses is often the selectivity and unevenness of those responses. And I'm just wondering if your research is, is um, demonstrating the factors that contribute to which emergencies um, are responded to and when international norms are, are likely to be invoked and most effective in terms of having an international response. Um, and, and whether you are sort of moving towards being able to provide sort of more explanation as to, to that selectivity that, that happens. Yeah, so I think a standard international relations response to that question would be it's all about politics and it's all about state interest. And I do agree to a large extent that is how international relations works. So what I'm trying to find here is dig into some of the nuance where we could get very pessimistic about the limitations of state interest or we could think how can we be creative in circumnavigating these structural factors that are going to just be a part of international political life. So what I'm doing in this next book project, I uh, haven't got the case studies all laid out yet, but it's, I'm doing a series of case studies. I uh, referred to some of them, you know, Central African Republic, South Sudan, um, Democratic Republic of Congo. I'm also looking at Sri Lanka and Libya. And I'm using uh, a socio-legal approach uh, on transnational legal orders, so using recursivity as a concept of how international community responds to the local and how those feedback loops then affect uh, an expansion of the normative, of the norm making process at the international level. So through those case studies, I'll then be looking at how international actors do respond 
not just to successes but mostly to failures and how those feedback loops then start to change the mandate of the institutions and how they respond. So I think what this project is doing is not, I don't think there's going to be an answer to selectivity because I think that's how the international system functions and that's the reality of it. But I think if we want to make some kind of progress, so as I was always say being the optimistic realist, <laughs> is if you want to make some kind of progress then you have to think how do you navigate and so, yeah, circumnavigate these kinds of uh, fixed obstacles and be creative about <coughs> the kinds of practices you can institute around those. Okay. Thank you very much, <coughs> Celia and Roger. Um, we will now move on from uh, security and we're going to move towards sustainability and resilience. So we have three uh, speakers under this theme. Thank you both. Thank you. Um, We have uh, Sharon Bessel and Frank Otto from the Crawford School, and we have George Carter from the Delft School. So we're going to start off with Sharon, who's going to tell us about the individual deprivation measure, ensuring we leave no one behind. Can people hear me if I'm speaking without a mic? Do I need the mic? Need the mic? <laughs> I've had a mixed response, so I'll have the mic just in case. Okay, so this is research um, that I'm involved in with uh, Janet Hunt, who's from CAPER at CAS, and a team at the Crawford School, um, Helen Such, um, Mandy Gap, and Trung Fun. So the individual depri deprivation measure began with research that came out of an Australian Research Council grant and is now continuing in a new phase um, that's funded by DCAT, which I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But what was the problem that we were trying to address in developing a new way of measuring poverty? And a new way of measuring poverty based on a new way of conceptualising poverty. So we know that inequality is a serious problem in the world today. We look at some of the figures around one, the top 1%, only 48% of the world's wealth, and that presents a whole range of issues about that large percentage of the population who have um, much less wealth. But what we need to be particularly concerned about, we argue, is this group that are at the very bottom. My clicker's not doing his much service here. The group who are at the very bottom. Those who are continuing to live in poverty, those who are in what is often described as the bottom billion. The Sustainable Development Goals have opened up a new agenda about how we think about development, about how we think about poverty measurement, and how we think about the ways in which we approach development and eradicating poverty. And so the Sustainable Development Goals have adopted the language of leaving no one behind, of ensuring that we're not simply going for the low-hanging fruit as we might have in the past, it's possible to increase poverty rates in countries by moving those people who are just below the poverty line to just above the poverty line and to look as though we are achieving something. And of course we are. What's more challenging and what the Sustainable Development Goals agenda focuses, us, focuses our attention on is those people who are at the very bottom, those who are most difficult to move above the, po the, the poverty line, this idea of leaving no one behind. But at the moment, with the measures of poverty that we have, it's very difficult to know who the one is or who those groups are who are at the very bottom. It's very difficult to know what factors are keeping them in poverty and how their poverty is playing out. We know quite a lot about income-based measures of poverty, but we don't know enough about multidimensional poverty, particularly for those groups who are in the deepest poverty. We also have a significant global gender data gap. 50 years after we started talking about gender equality within the global development agenda, we still have very few ways of conceptualising and measuring poverty that are genuinely sensitive to gender. And so one of the major focuses of the international community in the wake of the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals 
has been how we fill the global gender data gap, how we think about poverty and how we measure poverty in ways that are genuinely sensitive to gender and don't assume that women and men experience poverty in the same way. So we began our research and we continue um, to imagine what might be achieved if poverty were measured based on the dimensions that matter to people in their everyday lives. So poverty measurement for good reason has been defined by experts, but what do people who experience poverty on a daily basis say is important to them? Imagine what might be achieved if we could genuinely measure not just the material, but also the non-material dimensions of poverty, which is so important to those people who experience poverty every day. What might be achieved if we could move beyond the household? We still use the household most commonly as the unit of analysis. We assume that income or other assets, access to services, are spread equally within the household, we assume that the poverty of women and men are the same. Imagine what might be achieved if we had a way of measuring poverty that could reveal the different individual characteristics that shape the way in which poverty plays out. So not just the way in which poverty impacts on women's lives, but for example, on older women living in rural areas um, of a particular ethnic group. What might be achieved if using the language of the SDGs, which is really not much more than rhetoric at the moment, what could be achieved if we could reach the one who is being left behind? So what we're aiming to do with the individual deprivation measure is to bring some of these imaginings into reality. The individual deprivation measure is based on participatory research that was carried out with 2,000 people living in poverty across 18 sites in six countries. It has 15 dimensions of poverty, which were identified through that participatory research and also our reviews of current measures of poverty and the literature around poverty measurement and people's experience of poverty. And most importantly, it measures at the individual level. And so once we understand the way in which poverty plays out across each of these dimensions at the individual level, we're able to aggregate up to understand the way in which different social groups experience poverty. We're able to understand the way in which these dimensions come together, not just to add to the experience of poverty, but compound the experience of poverty, constraining and in many cases destroying people's lives. So the Individual Deprivation Measure Program in this second phase is a partnership between um, the Australian Government through the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade Civil Society, the International Women's Development Agency, which is placed, uh, based in Melbourne, um, and the ANU. And what we're aiming to achieve is to provide a tool that gives policy relevant data at the local and national levels, but also contributes to the agenda of the Sustainable Development Goals by giving us a means of identifying who it is that's being left behind, in what ways, and how we can respond. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sharon. Um, next we have George Carter. Um, George is with the, uh, the Bell School and he's going to talk to us about Pacific Islands diplomacy and consensus in climate change negotiations. Thanks, George. Thanks. Oh, is that one? Can you hear me from the back? So although, so although Pacific Island nations produce less than 1% of greenhouse gas emissions, these countries are at the front line of current impacts of climate change, whether it's extreme weather events, um, climatic events, such as cyclones, droughts, and um, ocean acidification, but very much uh, we all know about sea level rise. It gives this vulnerability of these countries also begs the question, are they just passive observers in international relations vis-a-vis -vis international climate change negotiations? My PhD, I'm, yes, and I'm a PhD candidate here at ANU, looks at the engagement of Pacific Island countries in international negotiations. And I try to unpack their work through the different negotiators uh, and their work um, within uh, uh, international negotiations. This predicament asks, how do you negotiate? I mean, how do you research this? And 2015 presented me with a unique 
experiment in the making of consensus or the making of Paris Agreement. So what it is, I follow Pacific Island countries as a negotiator for Samoa into every forum. So I use principles of process tracing and ethnography as a negotiator in all these various forums, both in the formal uh, UNFCC, in the, make, uh, in the ADP process, I mean, uh, ADP process in the making of the Paris Agreement, but also regionally in the Pacific, the different forums that are available, and to see working with prime ministers, ministers, working with negotiators, technical negotiators, private citizens, in every of these forums and how they make the decisions. But very much the concept that I look at uh, is the idea of consensus. Uh, this very idea of uh, building and making consensus. And so the process, uh, the research itself took me in 2015 from Samoa, Papua New Guinea, Fiji, Paris, um, Bonn, and New York. What does the research um, address in the, um, uh, in the following challenges? So I look at, I, at the essential idea of processes and models of con uh, consensus. In every of these forums, there are different ways of how consensus is made. Consensus is not, we all agree, it's when countries or states agree not to disagree. So there are different models of how uh, consensus is made within these forums, but also the process and the strategies that uh, states use uh, to force um, some forms of consensus. So it's about small states' multilateral engagement, specifically Pacific Island countries, and their interactions with other um, coalitions from other parts of the world, and are also within the, the wider um, UN um, um, system. It's about regional governance. It's looking into how Pacific countries make their decision making on in, in particular climate change within the Pacific. I also unravel the geopolitics of the small. They are small of the small, and it's, kind of, um, it's the cohesion, internal cohesion of Pacific Island countries. It's about Australia and Samoa's relationship. It's about Papua New Guinea and Tuvalu's relationship. It's not a unique, it's not uh, a, a, a region where everyone agrees. There are uh, differences and in, uh, internal uh, co cohesion uh, issues within um, the geopolitics of the small. It's about multi-actor delegations and multi-level negotiations. As I've said, uh, early, um, for Paris, 345 Pacific Islands from 14 countries went to negotiations amidst 38,000 negotiators. All of these 345, they are a mixture of island leaders, um, academics, uh, media, uh, private citizens, private businesses who are all forced into these small negotiations. So it's about unpacking how these multi-actor uh, uh, negotiations. But also what I also like to bring is the use of global political ethnography, fast-paced research, going to forums for one, uh, for, for one week or two weeks in multi, multi sites and trying to paint a picture of how consensus is through uh, not just in one unit, uh, one forum, but it's a series of, uh, of consensus in the making of, uh, in this case, the Paris Agreement. To finish off, these are some, some sites. You're looking at the Pacific Island Development Forum and how their form of inclusive and voluntary consensus uh, model. And it's about looking to the relationship of Australia, New Zealand, and the rest of the Pacific through uh, island state, uh, the Pacific Island Forum, and how the consensus is made, whereby it's, although the uh, decisions are, discussions are made right throughout a three month process, the ultimate decision relies on 16 men going into one room, uh, and all women to, to make the final decision. It's also unpacking how Marshall Islands um, uh, and its proactive engagement of bringing in the U European Union and the United States and also some countries from the like-minded group to work together on the issue of 1.5 and 2 degrees uh, long-term temperature goal. It's also about unpacking how Tuvalu pushed the United States in the very last stage of the Paris Agreement on the issue of loss and damage, an issue that I mean, uh, uh, something that's hard, hardly uh, uh, highlighted within um, uh, uh, climate, climate literature. And most importantly for me, and how, um, uh, how unique 2015 was for me, was the formation of the Pacific Island uh, SIDS coalition. Nothing, uh, it, wasn't, it did not exist before that, but you see now a, a regional, I mean, a, a negotiating body, which to this day continues on from the, uh, uh, focusing on uh, Pacific climate change issues at the UNFCC level. Thank you. Thank you, George. Did this small island developing space. Okay. All right. And now we have Frank Upso, um, who is going to talk to us about how Asia can decarbonize its economic growth. Thank you, Michael. 
I think I spotted uh, Ian Crowley there in one of your slides, right? In his capacity as negotiator for ELSIS or to Walloon. Yes, that's right. So this follows on in a sense from your presentation because uh, if, if the world wants to minimize the risk of climate change that could turn out catastrophic for Pacific Island states and many other countries, then we need to decarbonize. We need to take the emissions out of economic growth. Okay, and some of our work uh, is about understanding what are the ways to do that in economic and policy sense. Okay, so what we look at is economic growth. Um, and in China's case, here just as an example, we've seen economic growth uh, continue in uh, pace over the decades. Uh, the growth rate has slowed, but it's still an enormous amount of economic activity that is being added every year. Okay, so what does that do to greenhouse gas emissions? In this case, carbon dioxide emissions. Well, for a long time, there was an almost one-to-one -one correlation between increases in economic activity and increases in output of carbon dioxide. Okay, very bad news indeed. But over the last five years or so, we've seen a significant decoupling of those two variables in China. Okay? And so that's what we mean by uh, decarbonization, ultimately, right? Retaining economic growth, right? Uh, but, uh, but taking away the linkage to, to inca increasing greenhouse gas emissions. And we can co compute the ratio of the two variables, right? And what we want to see here is intensity, emissions intensity of GDP declining over time. Okay, we can look at that for a number of countries. And in the Asian region, the picture that emerges is actually um, a relatively positive one. I think I'm not doing anything with my clicker. You're doing yes, it, right? Thank you for that. <laughs> I'm just kind of randomly clicking, and sometimes something happens, sometimes doesn't. So next, next click. Um, and then another one. OK. So, and a few more, so we've got the labels. Oh, no, we've got the labels, okay. China on the left, okay. So, um, over the period 2000 to 2010, we've seen a decarbonization rate of about 1% per year. Over the period 2011 to 2016, we've seen a decarbonization rate of around about 6% per year, okay. So those kind of rates that we need to see globally over a very long time, over decades to come, in order to decarbonize the world economy right, <coughs> without damaging prospects for economic growth and development. Right? So China over the last five years is sort of a model of what we need to see globally. All right? uh, keeping in mind that China's absolute emissions are still growing because the economy is growing so fast. Right? So they're really decoupling uh, that, that ratio. Other countries in Asia, these are the six largest uh, emitting countries in, uh, in Asia. Labeling's not perfect, but what you have there is China, India, Japan, South Korea, Indonesia, and on the right, Australia. All rates between um, 1 and 3% reduction in carbon intensity per year. And the good news in all of these six largest Asian emitters, except India, that ratio of decarbonization has actually improved all the time. Right? It's um, we're on an accelerating decrease in, uh, in the carbon intensity of, of, of these economies. Very good news indeed. Um, the bad news is that we actually need to increase that substantially. Right? And so the question we're asking is, um, what can be done to underpin faster and sustained reduction in, uh, uh, in, in decarbonization? Right? So this slide is completely buggered up because it's not all about technology. <laughs> things that we're looking at are actually not visible on the slide. So just to, let's just black out the slide. You know what, I mean? um, what we're interested in is, is the, uh, the interaction between, between technological trends okay, and the economy, economic growth, structural change, and regulation, policy, society change. Okay? So what I mean by that is we've seen enormous change in the cost of low emissions technology. Tech, right? In the archetypal example, solar cells. Now, just 10 years ago, this was sort of an exotic technique that you would use only with massive subsidies or in very specialist applications. Okay? Now it's becoming mainstream, it's becoming a real competitor uh, for coal fired energy generation in developing countries. Right? It's, a, it's a revolution. Right? Still, we're not necessarily going to see widespread and exclusive uptake of those clean technologies without policy instruments, right? And so, you know, those need to be well designed and they need to fit 
the regulatory and economic framework. And China, again, is a wonderful case study that we're working on, right, where China is on the way to introducing the market-based instrument, the emissions trading scheme, but in the context um, of an energy system that's still very much command and control, right? And the two don't go very well together. And then finally, social change, all of this sort of massive change in the energy sector also means significant social change. It means change to regional economies. So um, you know, coal communities in particular, all the installations that rely on fossil fuels in a world that decarbonizes will see uh, their fortunes wane, while other regions and other sectors will rise. And frankly, this is not the first large scale industrial transition that we've seen. Uh, we know from past experience that ultimately they tend to work out well, but the road is bumpy and the, the social issues involved are significant. Uh, and as a result of those frictions, of course, we see on occasion very difficult politics arising from that. So kind of research is a tremendous opportunity for interdisciplinary research spanning all the way from the engineering and science, through social science, economics, um, and, and actually into, into the humanities as we're talking about societal responses. Thanks very much. Great, thank you. So panellists, could you come and join me? Um, I'm sure there's lots of questions. Uh, Chandra, we'll start with you. Thank you, Chandra. Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, the multi-dimensional poverty index um, has actually been developed by the Oxford um, Human Development um, Centre, the Oxford Centre for Human Development and Poverty, which is which is based at the University of Oxford and led by Sabine Alkia um, rather than, than Oxfam. And it is very closely based around the HDI. And Alkia has worked very closely with the March of Sen. And so you're right, those two things reflect one another. And essentially the MPI was um, just moving a little further from the HDI and replacing um, 
the, 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 the component of that measure around living standards, moving away from um, GNI to per capita to um, a list of, of um, ways of proxies for living standards. Mm -hmm. um, the individual deprivation measure is in some ways quite different from the MPI. Probably the major difference between the two is that the MPI does rely on existing data, so it, it uses existing household um, surveys and, and other surveys that are available. That's a huge strength because the data are there and so it's possible for the countries that, that collect the data and it's only three dimensions. Um, so for the countries that collect data around those dimensions, an MPI can be calculated and there's scope within the MPI for some adjustment to make it nationally appropriate. What we're doing with the individual deprivation measure is moving away from existing data. And we think that's a benefit, but we know that it's also a constraint because it means that you actually need to collect the data. Our critique has been that most data that are already gathered are gathered in ways that have not been sensitive to gender. And so in order to move beyond the constraints of existing data, we have no choice but to actually collect the data. So the IDM is based around two surveys, one at household level, but one at individual level, where we have a questionnaire that collects data on each of those dimensions. Um, and so we see that as the main difference. We know that will be a, a constraint in terms of uptake, um, but the governments that we're beginning to work with, so we're beginning to work in Indonesia at the beginning of discussions in South Africa, um, there's a recognition that particularly if we want to respond to poverty in a way that's gender sensitive, then we may have, we, we, we may have to seriously think about how we move beyond existing data and how we collect data differently. So I think that's the main difference with the MPI. Um, and we see great value in the MPI, but we think we're, we're contributing something beyond that, both in terms of gender sensitivity and the number of dimensions that we're looking at. Structural change, Chandra, exactly right, yeah. So um, in, in China, structural change has delivered much more change over the last five years than targeted regulatory measures. <coughs> um, China invested massively in cement plants, steel plants, and so on and so forth for its own infrastructure. Um, that is beginning to come to an end, and that's what we see in the data. And so going forward, regulatory measures will likely be more important. to reduce the um, GDP over yeah, so the research that, you know, and it's not just myself, there's a whole number of people at Crawford School and through the college who are working on these types of issues. And um, the questions that, that we tend to be most interested in is, is what is feasible economic policy and regulatory design to facilitate those changes in a way that is desirable for society overall. And typically that means in a way that does not compromise the opportunities for economic growth and development. Okay? And so the question is where are the technological opportunities and where can that change be facilitated in an economically uh, beneficial way? So do you think your, your research <coughs> can be an indicator to direct the future research for science and um, other, you know, I think mostly science research? Oh yeah, look, I mean, this, this, this research is, is very applied. So just to give you an example, um, a few years ago, we led the Australian part of a multinational study in, into decarbonisation of individual national economies. And that was a mapping out of technological opportunities to get to a, to a very low emissions point by the middle of the century, right? And we took that analysis out into policy circles, you know, governments, opposition, state and federal governments, and into, into business and into industry as well. I think we can safely say that that helped facilitate um, a dialogue about these issues. Um, that was a much more positive one than the usual mudslinging over, over 
carbon tax is bad and these kinds of things, okay? So I think that's actually a, an extremely valuable role that we at the universities and, and in the college can, can play in, in helping different players in the debate who often have very opposing viewpoints and interests, right, to come together um, in, in thinking about proper research and analysis that lies behind the issues that they're squabbling over. Right? So, yes, very applied and very targeted. Thank you very much. Okay, Jenny and then Vera. Thanks. Um, two questions. One for Sharon. Um, do you think that your measure may eventually be used as a way of um, assessing the effectiveness of policies and you know, gauging policy interventions? And what do you have to do to get to that point? And then a question for Frank. Um, do you find that your, or what are the risks of the messaging that you have as a result of your research being taken to simply reinforce ideological positions. So, you know, one reading of what you've shown us is we don't need to do anything, it's all fine, it's headed in the right direction. So there's a risk of that complacency. It raises a really interesting question for policy-related research. You know, you can either just take the view that we were hearing earlier, you do the research, you put it out there, they take it or they leave it, um, or you engage with a nuanced interpretation that draws out you know, the implications from it. And if you don't do that, there's always a risk that the research gets taken in a different way. Um, thanks, Jenny. When we, we first began this research, um, and we um, thought that the most, one of the, the more valuable purposes of it would be um, being able to compare across countries, so having the, the, the score, so we can calculate up a country score or um, you know, a score for women or a score for men. And that, it, it, in relating to Chandra's point, is kind of in the same space as the HDI, so being able to do some kind of global ranking in comparison. As we've moved forward with this research, we actually think that's perhaps the least valuable part of it, although there is a global appetite for that. Um, we think, we hope, it will be policy relevant. And we think that where it is likely to be most policy relevant is the nuanced kind of information that it gives about particular groups in particular dimensions. And so that has the potential to be quite valuable in informing policy because where do you need to target, where do you need to target what kinds of interventions and potentially allowing to track progress over time of particular interventions for particular groups in particular places. So as the next step, we're doing an IDM study um, early next year in Indonesia. We're piloting at the moment. Um, and we're, we've spent quite a lot of time doing stakeholder engagement. So we're hoping that we will be able to work with local governments in the districts where we gather the data to then work through what the data means in local contexts, but also how it can be used in a policy sense, and then to work with those local governments to track how they've used it, if they use it, and how valuable it's been um, as a way of trying to test um, whether it is as policy relevant as we hope it will be. Jenny, thank you for the, for the important question there in terms of the, the framing and the context. And I should add that this kind of research takes place in the context of, um, of a lot of research that is basically complete doom and gloom. So, you know, keeping temperature rise to two degrees or even, you know, well below two degrees, one and a half degrees as per Paris Agreement, is widely seen as, uh, as a pipe dream, okay? And so, within that, though, right, what I'm personally most interested in uh, is to ask the question, how could it be done, right? How might it be possible, right? And when you look back um, at projections made 20 years ago about technology, about rates of change, about clean tech uptake, right? Then the mainstream projections were far too pessimistic compared to what actually happened. And so, you know, I think we can, we can make the case that there is a kind of a pessimism bias in, in much of the analysis because it tends to extrapolate out and tends to discount the possibilities for structural uh, breaks uh, and, and, and paradigm shifts, right? 
And so, you know, I mean, that, I guess to an extent that's a professional choice to make, um, to engage in the kind of research that asks the question, okay, so, so how could this be done? Uh, is the statement, yes, we can, um, just justifiable. Okay. So that's, I guess, the, the choice I make in, um, in focusing on, on this type of research. Okay, last question, Mira. Thank you. It's, it's a great question. And we, we have struggled and continue to struggle with some of those issues. Um, we decided to, we, or we took the decision to call the measure the individual deprivation measure rather than the pov a poverty measure, um, in part for the reasons that, that you're articulating, in part because we didn't want to go head to head with the multidimensional poverty index. <laughs> so there was some pra pragmatic thinking. Um, so it, it, those conceptual issues, I think we we have not completely clarified, but I think I'd also say that we grounded this in participatory research, but as participatory as that research was designed to be, it also had the biases of the research team and the researchers, and you know, we, we recognise that. One of the important things we think about, the, the way in which this, this measure pushes some of the debates is by including the non-material dimensions of deprivation or poverty, depending on the terminology that you want to use. So for example, when we did the participatory work, people talked very powerfully, and particularly women talked very powerfully, about the importance of social relationships and the way in which if one was excluded from relationships of support, then poverty was deepened. Um, and often poverty meant that people couldn't engage in those relationships of support because you couldn't reciprocate. So most measures of, of poverty or deprivation don't pick up those non-material measures which are about income but are not only about income. They're about social relationships and inclusion and exclusion and stigma. Um, and so where we've, we've tried to, I guess, push some of the definitions around poverty and or deprivation is around those non-material elements and suggesting that it's very important to capture those as well because responding to material needs may not be enough, particularly in, in situations of, um, of, of deep social hierarchies, of deep... Um, patriarchal structures um, and of deep social stigma. Okay. All right. Um, could you please join me in thanking George, Sharon, and Frank? shows that about 69% of people in India were involved in corruption. Um, if, if we add in some who didn't report their involvement and deduct some of those who just had to be corrupt because of, it was a matter of life and death, we still end up with a number like 700, 750 million people in India 
all of who, that's to give you in relative terms, 25 times the population of Australia, more than double the population, entire population of America, including Trump and his family, all living in India, being corrupt. Uh, now either we denigrate an entire culture, or at least a large part of it, as ethically dubious, or we question the categories with which we, such as those of corruption, with which we investigate and try to understand this culture, its past and present. I chose to do the latter. Uh, my research examines the way in which uh, we use the, way, the, the categories with which we attempt to understand and make sense of the world around us. Uh, the interesting fact about a lot of these categories that we use so comfortably, like nation, democracy, corruption, civil society, is that they all have a past. They all are a product of roughly 17th to 19th century. And what else was happening at that time? This was a time when a large part of the world was colonized. Which is, to, that is to say, that the experiences of a large part of the world that was colonized was not taken into account when uh, coming up, when, when, when presenting categories that we now assume are global universals, that we assume universally apply to societies around the world. And then it's no surprising that we run into trouble. Um, if we um, actually take um, another example, that of nation. There is no nation. There, you don't find nation in nature. Nation is just a category that uh, we posit as a response, as a description of one historically contingent form of human uh, community formation. And it stands to reason that different pasts of different people, different historical trajectories, would culminate in different kinds of community formation. And the very fact that a large part of the world, large uh, percentage of the world, talks of itself in terms of nations is the imperialism of categories at work. So my research attempts to uncover or understand the ways in which these so-called universal categories are not only a product of colonialism, but actually the way in which they don't work. So we end up having very strange debates about how India is not yet a nation. It just celebrated its 70th anniversary as an independent sovereign uh, region, but we sort of say it's not yet become. The national sensibility is gone awry. Something's not quite right. And, and there's reason for doing that. Um, it, to, to continue with the example of the nation, um, the, the um, Gandhi, who is ironically called the father of the Indian nation, he uh, rejected the idea of the nation. For him, he said, well, if we want to speak of India as a nation, we don't need to reject colonialism. We don't need to ask the British to leave because they do nation so well. And sadly, then, he was called the father of the nation. So there's some problem. There's, there's a great imperialism at work in the very discourse and in the very terminology that we use to understand these cultures. Um, again, to continue with the example of the nation, uh, the Indian army song is the in army song of the Indian nation is written by the national poet of Pakistan. So clearly, the idea of the nation is very weak at best. Now what happens when we use terms like nation to understand these cultures, to understand these regions, is we end up with a kind of vague estimation where we might say, yes, it is a nation, but also not a nation. It needs to become a nation. If it develops certain sensibilities, it would become a nation, or it's very much on its path to becoming a nation. So uh, my research begins to investigate or investigates these ideas and why they do not make sense within context outside of the ones where they emerge. Sometimes they do, but often they don't. And so what, what do we do to understand a large part of the world for which we don't have a language um, to understand and describe it? 
Well, it's easy. We just start to excavate ideas, languages, uh, categories from within the region that then can build up slowly to a lexicon that would provide us with a coherent language to understand and describe the past and present. Mira, thank you. Uh, we next have Matt Tomlinson, who's going to talk to us about how you speak with the dead. Thanks, Matt. Hi, thank you. Michael? This is up? Good. OK, how many of you have seen a ghost? I have to come, right? OK, I'm not here to talk about seeing ghosts, but hearing them, uh, talking with them. Let me start with your existential objection. I know many of you will have read that title and said, you don't? You can't? Why are you posing this question? Please do note the subtitle with the asterisk. Why does this question matter for social science? I've just started a project. This is brand new. So if it sounds under theorized, it's because it is. But here's what I'm working with. I'm working with uh, spiritualists in Australia. Spiritualists are a group famously associated with the Victorian era. Parlor seances, people would host, have mediums in their home, and tables would tip, and spirit knocking would be heard. Those three sisters there are the Fox sisters. They are actually Americans, and they are held to have started the modern um, spiritualist religion. Spiritualism quickly took off across America. It was the era of, of a lot of religious ferment and revival. It then took on very strongly um, in Britain, and then into Australia. And in Australia, the longest, the, the very longest existing spiritualist church in the world is in Melbourne. Today, Australia has about 11,500 spiritualists nationally, so not a large religious group, but probably not as tiny as you might have imagined. The reason I'm looking at spiritualists is to understand bigger issues, including, first, changing understandings of the afterlife. I'm working on this project with a sociologist at Eakin named Andrew Singleton, and he and I have been talking about this because a lot of the ideas that spiritualism began with in the, the mid to late 19th century have become more commonplace than a lot of us realize. The old classical Christian understanding of heaven and hell is not something that most people subscribe to anymore. But the generic sense of a benign space after you die where you might be reunited with your family in some way is quite commonly subscribed to by many Australians and in fact is the fruit of spiritualism. So part of our motivation in setting this up is to say, uh, historically, sociologically, culturally, that we think spiritualism has punched above its weight. The second reason is changing understandings of the family. I'm an anthropologist, I study kinship. Um, I, I don't think I'm going out on a limb when I say that all societies imagine spiritual worlds. And when you look at them from an analytical distance, you notice that those spiritual worlds have strong connections with the actual lived social worlds. So one of the things that interests me in particular is the way that as family structures are changing in Australia, and as new forms of sociality and mobility are opening up across Australian society generically, the, the vision of the afterlife seems to be constricted. So as our actual expansive possibilities take off, more and more the afterlife is described in the space of your family and friends. So there's a great historical transition. So when the Fox sisters started modern spiritualism, they were starting by knocking, there were sounds knocking on tables, there were sort of invented codes of communication, but the people they were speaking with were folks like Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin, the famous American adventure, inventor and patriot. Benjamin Franklin showed up at all those early seances. Um, people like that don't show up anymore. Uh, Australian Prime Minister <laughs> Alfred Deakin was a spiritualist. He doesn't show up at seances. Your grandparents. The third reason is uh, I, I'm, I'm keen to keep pushing this idea of religious thought in a secular age. Many people will describe an overwhelmingly secular Australian culture. I think that's a big misstatement. I think there are a lot of ideas that we can fairly call religious that underlie a lot of the ways people think about how metaphysics works. So the power of positive thinking may sound like a business thing. But in fact, it's the new age idea that's coming from the sense that you yourself, your soul, can cultivate an energy that's going to change what's around you. I think spiritualism is very much a part of the generic ideas that many Australians have about unseen worlds. 
I'm not saying that Australia doesn't have deep pockets of secularism, but I'm saying that the pockets of spiritualism may be deeper and wider than we realize. So the key results are pending, because I've just begun. It is making a difference in my research, I hope, because it is about a deeply cultural response to a universal process. I can't emphasize this enough. Every society treats death, often with an obsessive sort of ritualism. Every society does that. Not every society holds seances. Not every society wants to speak to their grandparents and their best friends from long ago. And I want to understand what's distinctly Australian at the present moment in the practices of spiritualists and how they articulate with larger social formations. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, fascinating and spooky stuff. And uh, now we have Jane Ferguson, um, who's going to talk to us about the tribes of Savannah Bumi. Okay. Thank you. So Welcome to Royal Orchid Service. Now, you'll notice that a lot of cultural anthropologists, they like to wear the ethnic clothing of the peoples that they study. And so in this case, I am donning the vestments of a uh, baggage handler or a ramp service worker, uh, known disparagingly by cabin crews as uh, a ramp rat. So, um, all right, go back to my script a little bit. <clears throat> so anyway, so much ink, toner, and ether have been spilled on the aviation industry by techno geeks and apologists for globalization. So my research, based on fieldwork in Myanmar and Thailand, is essentially asking, what can we learn from the people who actually operate this vast logistical network? And um, for example, I have been doing fieldwork on the uh, Pantamit, the uh, Thai political movement known as the Yellow Shirts, and their seizure of the Bangkok airports in 2008 from the point of view of airline workers themselves. And interestingly, in this book, Aerotropolis, the authors, they write, in a perverse experiment, PAD would prove how critical the airports are to Thailand's economy by wrecking both. The tourists noticed first. And the people who worked in the airport noticed second somehow. So anyway, what I learned talking to customer service who were on duty during the siege, I learned how the last flight departed with neither catering, cabin service, nor ramp service. Hmm. I learned how collaboration across sectors could still get the plane out in siege conditions. As one gate agent told me, taking over the airport was easy. Think about it. They only entered the service road and the departures hall. And then the whole airport shut sectors would have to choose to stop working. So there were airport workers who agreed with the protest or wanted an excuse not to work. Many Thai Airways flight attendants, in solidarity with the yellow shirts, joined the siege. One called the takeover a Nan Wat, or Temple Merit Making Festival. There was a stage, food, and stalls sold snacks and t-shirts uh, with the proceeds going to benefit the PAD. Large donations would be announced. For example, one flight attendant recalled, they wouldn't say so, but I knew one of the named sponsors was a Thai Airways pilot, and he contributed a million baht. It was amazing, because pilots are usually so stingy. These experiences teach us some important lessons in logistical se sector interdependency and improvisation, as well as about action and solidarity within aviation. The technical is cultural and political. Ganbin Thai mi kwam yin di ti ja amnoi kwam suduak sabai balot dam dun tang ta. Thank you for your attention. We hope you enjoy and have a pleasant flight. Wonderful stuff. Okay. Come and join me uh, up here, folks, now. Uh, are there questions from the audience? Yes, please. Mark, I'm Mark Dunn with Jane. I was interested in whether any of the people that you interviewed actually thought that the occupation of the airport was an act of terrorism, which was a political and, and legal discussion at the time. Yeah. Um, and, and where their sympathies might have played on that question, their workplace feelings, as well as the PAD. Um, 
Yes, in fact, um, one of the gate agents that I had interviewed, she said that she was sympathetic with the cause of the yellow shirts, but wanted it to be less violent. Um, you know, I talked to three people who were on duty when some of the bombs went off on uh, November 25th. And so, yes, the, indeed, there were people that were very frightened about it. And then also, um, you know, within the workplace, there's people of different political solidarities who did not like the yellow shirts one bit. I mean, what's interesting is it goes along uh, with ideas of class, nation, royalism, you know, all of these other things. The point is, a lot of the reports that I read about it in the international news would only uh, profile people who were political actors or tourists and not giving um, airport workers the possibility that they would be politicized or have political opinions themselves. Okay. I've got a question for Mira. Mira, it, it strikes me, using the corruption example, that one of the reasons we think corruption is a bad thing is because we, we associate it with, a, with an ultimate goal, which is um, that it actually detracts from national economic wealth and ac economic performance. So to an extent, the categories you're looking into, are you kind of looking at the reasons they've become categories, the ultimate, yeah. the, you know, the ultimate causes of the formation of those categories? That's, um, no, you're, you're absolutely right that, you know, it is not a sort of a condemning corruption per se, but what then it uh, engenders, if you want. Um, but uh, again, taking a step back, we realize that when people are complaining about corruption, um, they are not entirely certain what, uh, I mean, they are, of course, voicing some discontent, but that discontent, that there's a gap between what is theorized as corruption, what is under, understood as corruption, and what the complaint of the people is. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, um, sort of uh, pre-liberalized, pre uh, yeah, pre-economic liberalization in India, um, one of the most uh, sought after commodities was alcohol. Uh, you know, imported alcohol, which you couldn't bring into the country. Uh, there, were, there was quotas. Um, so anyone who traveled out of the country would uh, try to smuggle in, and, and, and that would be the correct term, um, more alcohol than they were allowed. Uh, customs officers knew this, and they would take one bottle and let you go with the rest. And then these same people would say, well, customs officers are very corrupt. So is that, is that sort of a condemnation of corruption, or is that a voicing of um, discontent with the economic policy? Um, so when we try to look at it as corruption, uh, we miss the, the various kinds of discontent that is being uh, vocalized in this amorphous category of corruption. So in 2014, there was an, a large anti-corruption march uh, in, in Delhi. And I was, I was there, and I was talking to some of the people who were all up in arms against corruption. And I said, absolutely, we must fight against the linemen and you know, the auto rickshaw drivers who are so corrupt. And, and they got really uncomfortable and said, oh, but you know, these people, they're not paid much, and, and, and it's OK if they ask for a little more money. But the corruption that we are talking about is you know, the rich businessman and the politician. So then again, it's not really corruption that is a problem. Problem is with the political. The problem is with the bureaucratic. And uh, we miss um, analyzing or understanding this because we are misdiagnosing it as corruption. Yeah. So, the, which is where the category, so uh, the category needs to be investigated, dismantled, and maybe reformed as something else, yeah. but uh, this one doesn't work. So because the category there's something conceals rather than reveals. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, this See. is for Matt. I, I, I like your, your conceptualization. What I didn't get is why there should be anything peculiarly or distinctly Australian about spiritual. Uh, it sounds like the sort of thing that one could hear in the States. Right. <clears throat> well, this is true, and I'm not 100% sure, and I am going to uh, spend very brief periods in the US and the UK just just talking with spiritualists there to see if I get an initial sense. Um, I should say spiritualism, as I understand it, is very much a product of, of these three countries. I mean, there's, there's French versions too, so French spiritism, I'll have Kardec. But I'm thinking especially Australian spiritualism is coming from American and UK spiritualism, so I don't know that it is distinct from that. 
What makes it distinct, though, from other traditions is, is a, it's turned into a hyper-verbal performance. What interests me is the, the origins of spiritualism, there was a lot about tangible manifestation. And you know, there was a lot of fraudulence. So mediums would dip their hands in phosphorescent paint and then you know, sort of stick it out like this and you would see a hand floating in the air. So that doesn't happen anymore, at least to, not to my knowledge. What you get now and what interests me about this formation, which is similar to some kinds of shamanism, but again, it's, it's purely verbal here. Mediums go into a very light trance in which, in their mind, they're having a dialogue with the spirit. They're getting information, and on the one hand, they don't want to overinterpret it, but on the other hand, they have to make it into a message that can be communicated to the human audience. And so it's kind of a hinged dialogue. You have a mental dialogue, which can come through various sensations, but ultimately in the mind, that then gets turned into an actual give and take dialogue. So one of the things I'm doing is recording the services. One of the most fascinating things I found is you know the, the popular image of spiritualists is that they're all frauds, right? And the mediums are all cynical. And I'm quite sure this is really not the case with the mediums practicing in Canberra. They're, they're very evidently, wholeheartedly um, embracing this and believe that they really are communicating. And what they do, we were talking earlier about strategic risks. They speak in ways that are exceptionally prone to failure, right? So the idea of the, a, a performing TV medium will come up and say, uh, I see an old woman with me. Her name begins with an M. And someone in the background will say, my grandmother's name is Mary. And I'll say, oh, thank you so much. And then I'll deliver a message. And everyone says, oh, come on. You know, that's <laughs> <laughs> Spiritualists in Canberra do not do this. They will say this. I'm with a man. He died in his 60s. I think of a heart attack, although he may have also had other problems. He walked with a slight stoop. He was very fond of colorful clothes. He really liked dressing very brightly. He smoked a pipe. Uh, but not very often. And I think that he loved going on boat trips. You might remember him from the boat trip. There's so much specific detail that you can imagine a million ways it can fail. And here's what's interesting. It often does fail. It often does fail, and audiences often have a degree of skepticism, even as they're committed to the larger principle that you can communicate with the dead. The question is, that's not my uncle you're talking about. So um, I think there are very distinct features, and a lot of them are actually linguistic. There's a linguistic performance of how you convey an idea of spirit. Uh, I probably overstated it when I said it was specifically Australian, but I do think it's the Western spiritualist tradition. That was an interesting talk. Um, what I found interesting is that in these ideas of spiritualism, there's these ideas of uh, past and over, I guess. Um, I spent a bit of time in the Cook Islands where you'll find the grave sites of past members. Yeah, thank you very much. Almost all of my previous research was in Pacific Islands, and especially in Fiji. And I don't dare tell Fijians about this project, because the, 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 the strong Christian impulse there would be to say, why are you talking to demons? You shouldn't be doing that. Um, in, in Fiji, the dead are around very much so, and they linger, and they're very much in place. They're in specific places. In Fiji, too, there's a, there's a lot of drinking of the beverage kava every day, and there's a sense that that automatically puts you in touch with the ancestors. So in Fiji, it's almost like it's, it's too easy to have the dead around. And as good Christians, you kind of have to cut them off to a certain extent. Um, in spiritualism, the idea is, yes, they're very much all around, but you kind of have to work hard to get them in touch with you in the way you want to get them in touch with you. I think that's totally true. And the difference here, though, too, also is there's different um, engagements between Christianity and spiritualism in Australia. As I understand it, again, my research is just beginning, there are some groups that very much try to combine both. But the group I'm working with is very much against that and very strongly says we are not Christians and we think we're misrepresented by Christianity and we think we're doing something completely different. Question for Jane. Uh, are airline workers in general pro-globalization? Do they th even think about globalization as something that's 
necessary to their livelihoods? Um, perhaps not in, in those terms. I mean, also, like, for example, uh, flight attendants would be interested in, you know, the work conditions, the, uh, the union labor struggle for them, like, you know, how their lives are structured according to the times that are dictated by, by their employer. Um, also, if the employer is able to get another route further afield, that if that means more flying, better flying, what kinds of conditions, like for example, Thai Airways used to operate a Bangkok to Newark, a nonstop flight, but it was just too long of a duty day for some of the flight attendants that they said, oh, it's just too exhausting, too far. Mm -hmm. So um, they do very much think about you know, globalization and the reach that the transportation enables them, but also it's very real to them because it's very tangible yeah. in, in those aspects because it directly affects their, their livelihood, their sure. health, their job, etc. cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions or issues people might have? Okay, please join me in, in thanking Jane, Mira, and Matt. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we now move uh, to development. Um, and we've got a really interesting uh, group of people to talk to us about development, all from the Crawford School. We've got Paul Burke, Terence Wood, and Keone Yak. And Paul's going to start off by talking about energy subsidy reforms in Indonesia. Thanks, Paul. Excuse me, please. Yeah. Traffic jams. Traffic jams. If you have been to Jakarta or to another Asian mega city, you would probably be familiar with this type of scene. It's sitting in a Jakarta traffic jam that I thought of the research idea for my current research. Some countries maintain large fossil fuel subsidies. What that means in the case of road transport is that gasoline and diesel have been available at a very low price, below the cost of supply, production and supply. What happens if you have low price petrol? Surely one of the implications is that you're more likely to have traffic jams. In Indonesia in 2013 and 2014, there were some very large reforms implemented by President SDY and Jokowi. Overnight, on several occasions, they increased the petrol price to try to reduce spending on fuel subsidies. For example, on the 22nd of June 2013, President SDY increased the price of gasoline by 44% overnight. For an economist like me, this is a perfect opportunity for research because it's a big change in a price. And I was interested in one question. What is the effect on the traffic? In this research, we used data from an Indonesian toll road company for 19 roads in Indonesia on the number of vehicles using the roads. We were interested in what happened after the fuel price went up. We found and concluded that the fuel price reforms have led to a substantial slowing in the growth in traffic numbers in Jakarta and elsewhere in Indonesia as well. So as of today, we estimate that on the roads in our study, there's around 10% fewer vehicles on the road than would have been the case if the reforms had not gone ahead. That can lead to quite large differences in uh, the slowness of traffic. Can we click? We also extended the research to look at electricity. So as of the very moment, one of the biggest reforms going on in Indonesia is large reductions in electricity subsidy spending. Previously, gasoline plus electricity subsidy spending was about 20% of Indonesia's budget. That's a lot of resources going into providing cheap fuel and also electricity. So at the very moment, Prices for electricity are being put up for different types of consumers across Indonesia. So they have gone up for industry and for business and other groups as well. This year prices are going up for many 
households. So currently, uh, as of this year, for 20 million households, the price of electricity is going up by 100% this year. Quite large price increases. Uh, we have researched the effect of this fuel price, of this electricity price change, in terms of electricity efficiency. What's the effect on how much electricity consumers are using? We find that there's a substantial reduction in electricity use or an improvement in energy efficiency as a result of the price reform. It makes more sense for us to turn off the air conditioner in the spare room when we're forced to pay the non-subsidised price for electricity. If electricity is very cheap, then we might leave that air conditioner running. We can see the effects of the reforms in the data and our research has been trying to estimate accurately what the effect has been. Indonesia's energy subsidy reforms have most likely been pro-poor in nature and the reason for that, there are several reasons for that. One is that poor households have been exempted from the electricity price increases. Another is that the revenues saved from the reforms have been used uh, in some pro poor ways, for example, direct transfers to low-income households. Also, it's important to remember that previously, most of the benefits from the fuel and electricity subsidy reforms were going to the relatively well-off. The aim of our overall research is to provide evidence on, or evidence to justify the movement away from fossil fuel subsidies and towards a tax on fossil fuels fossil fuel use. So for example, in the case of, of road transport, moving away from fossil fuel subsidies and towards a fuel excise does make sense from several points of view. It's much better for the overall fiscal balance of the country. Uh, it can help to reduce emissions and also put the country onto a greener development trajectory. And also we find that it helps to reduce traffic jams as well. We're looking to continue this research, so other energy subsidy topics in Indonesia, for example, perhaps kerosene or LPG, and also to look at other countries as well. So I look forward to any conversations or ideas uh, that any of you might have on that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. Okay, next we have Terence Wood. Terence is going to talk to us about can information change public support for aid? Thanks, Terence. Uh, thanks, Mark, for giving this. Um, I might actually. Does the clicker work or I need your help? Okay, I'll, I'll go with it. Technology is going to go. So, without this, you can actually hear me via the microphone on the stand. I might start that way at least. I'll pick up the microphone and I'll uh, commence pacing at some point in this talk. So in 2013, when the Abbott government started slashing the aid budget, most Australians were supportive of the actions that they were taking. The relationship between public opinion and foreign policy certainly isn't a straightforward one, but there's reasonable evidence to suggest that public opinion plays some role in shaping high-level aid policy. And so, ever since 2013, aid supporters have been faced with the challenge of trying to win around Australians to the cause of foreign aid. Okay. Um, one way of increasing Australian support for aid might be to provide them with information. Uh, the average Australian knows little about aid. Uh, maybe they'd feel differently if they just knew a little bit more. Uh, and this is where my research comes in. I tested the impact of information on news about aid using survey experiments. And I'm going to speak about two of these experiments today. Each experiment had a control group who were asked a very basic question about whether they thought Australia gave too much or too little foreign aid. And each experiment also had a treatment group which was asked the same question but which was provided with additional information. And the logic of survey experiments is such that the aggr aggregate difference in responses between the treatment and control groups tells us the effect or the impact of the additional information that's been provided. In the first experiment's treatment, people were told just how little Australia spends uh, on foreign aid as a share of overall federal spending. So it's less than one cent in every dollar, not a lot. And we provided people with information on this fact. Um, 
we thought, uh, well, the logic behind this experiment was most Australians, when they're asked, actually uh, can overestimate how much aid Australia gives by a significant degree. We also know there's a correlation between overestimation and the desire to see aid cut. That is, people who overestimate the amount of aid that Australia gives more are more likely to be people who think that Australia gives too much aid. We know that from other research. Um, and so the logic of the treatment is simply that if you correct people's misunderstandings, surely they'll update their views. The second, in the second experiment, I gave the treatment group a comparator. I contrasted recent aid cuts in Australia with increases, recent increases in the aid budget in the United Kingdom. The logic here is that knowing about norm, international norms in the form of another relevant country's actions might affect opinions. I thought the first experiment would work. work. I thought the logic was impeccable. Um, I'm a New Zealander. However, before commencing with the uh, second experiment, I did uh, reach out to my Australian colleagues, and they assured me that the average Australian these days that could, doesn't care at all about what goes on in the United Kingdom. Uh, so this is an amateur anthropology, if you will. I had a crack at it, uh, and I came away from it fairly confident that the second experiment would not work. Naturally, I was wrong. So here we see the results of the first experiment, uh, telling people aggregate, aggregate responses in both the control and the treatment groups in the first experiment were more or less the same. So telling people just how little aid Australia gives uh, has almost no effect on uh, their views about how much aid Australia should give. On the other hand, contrasting Australia with the United <coughs> Kingdom had a substantial effect so the share of respondents who thought Australia gave, gave, gives too much aid fell by 12 percentage points, and the share of respondents who thought that Australia does not give enough aid rose by a similar amount. What does this mean? Well, the practical lesson to be taken away from this for aid campaigners is that they shouldn't naively assume that the provision of correct information will be enough to change people's views about aid. On the other hand, they shouldn't give up on engagement, uh, making use of information, because it turns out that people's views about foreign aid aren't entirely impervious to uh, additional information, and to people aren't entirely resistant to changing their views on the basis of additional information. More theori theoretically, in terms of political psychology, I found that an appeal to norms was efficacious where facts alone failed. This is a new, however, the normative community in my work was an unusual one the international community. Uh, and this is a new finding uh, of relevance to our understanding of the psychology of international relations. <coughs> so that's all I have to say. Happy to take any questions that you might have. Thanks very much, Terence. Now we have Fiona Yap, who's going to talk to us about connecting politics and economics to development. Thanks, Fiona. Thank you, Michael. Now, the reason we look at politics is because we, already, we accept, in general, that we need government to coordinate. And in many cases, government even leads development through policy making. Now, a government that is strong enough to lead policy making, to make sure that all of us abide by policies, would also be strong enough to confiscate your wealth at any time. So the question is not really, why do we need government, but rather, how do we keep government in check? And in that regard, I want to look at the East Asia and ask, well, what does experience, the East Asian experience tell us? We oftentimes think of East Asia in very fond terms, especially the government. We have strong governments who are very enlightened. And I think the epitome of the enlightened government would be Singapore. Many of us are very, uh, have a great indifference about Singapore in the sense that in terms of a country, this is not foremost, not cutting any barriers in terms of democracy, but it's doing very well. So I'd love to tell this story about Singapore. About 20 years ago, and probably even before then, and maybe slightly after that, on election day, this no-nonsense 
played by the book government and whom we know is more than happy to throw the book at you government, um, every election day, on the day itself, you'll see unlicensed street vendors all over the country and not a police in sight. <laughs> and I always ask, that is what the, the East Asian experience tells us about the, the roles of government. And what is that? Governments are kept in check by the rules of the game and expectations of how citizens behave, given that it has a set of choices that it will pursue. And so the interaction model here is like a chess game. Now this strategic interaction between government and citizens actually explains why governments appear strong. Citizens seem content and complacent, yet we see room for progressive political change that continues to spur economic growth. Now, my, this research is important and the findings are relevant because it provides a more empirically founded position relative to what we call modernization theory, which is this is how countries develop and democratize. It is more robust than the development state theory. And of course, the most recent um, iteration of this is the Asimo Blue and Robinson inclusive and growth model, inclusive state and growth model. More importantly, for my own purpose, it shows how citizens can influence and engage politically in East and Southeast Asia, and where government accountability can be built even in countries that we think are autocratic. And of course, it explains why democratization and when democratization will occur in these countries. And for the benefit of those of us who still have uh, this indifference about Singapore, it explains why Singapore succeeds. <laughs> um, in terms of future research, the, this strategic interaction model tells us why corruption matters and how it matters. It tells us why political trust matters. And I'm particularly moved because recently, I'm hearing people tell the same story. We're focusing too much on institution building and not enough on economic growth. And my theory actually tells you we need to focus on institution building. And of course, the future research of this is to bring political trust back into policy making in East and Southeast Asia so that we have this outcome called policy capacity. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Fiona. And I have our panelists up the front here. Ask the audience if you've got any questions about those very different but very fascinating presentations. Tim. I have a question for Tara. Tim McGrath from the Corporate School. Um, my question goes to the, the, your selection of the UK as a comparator. I wonder actually how. I disagree with your colleagues, by the way. I think that Australians have a clear relevance with the UK. But I wonder, really, how does that relevance and uh, that, that comparison change um, with perhaps the US or, 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 or elsewhere? Or if you go to the other extreme and say somewhere like Russia, I don't know what they're thinking about. I wonder how the impact of the comparative country will play out in your, in your study. Y yeah, so that's absolutely the right question to be asking. And when I chose the United Kingdom, I chose a country that uh, had a track record which was re really significantly different from Australia's in recent years. So there was a striking contrast. Were I to compare uh, Australia to my uh, own personal, personally preferred uh, country of contrast, New Zealand, it wouldn't have done much because New Zealand's equally tight-fisted when it comes to giving foreign aid. Mm -hmm. The other key thing about the United Kingdom is that there is some historical connection um, that, you know, that is maintained in some ways. Uh, you could have compared Australia to Sweden, which is a very generous aid donor, but uh, my guess is that the average Australian could, could care less what Sweden is doing. I mean, that's what I thought about the UK initially too, and I was, until I was proven wrong. Um, so maybe I could be proven wrong with Sweden too, and that's a, a, a way that I could take the research in the future. But t as a starting point, I wanted a comparator that seemed both um, sort of conceptually relevant or normatively relevant to the average Australian and also one which provided a striking contrast. Archie. Yeah. 
Yeah, we studied the effect of the fuel price changes on the number of vehicles using these roads, yeah. uh, partly because that was what we had available. Yeah. Uh, as you know, when we find a good data set, we need to, to use that one. Yes. Um, but also, um, traffic jams are important for our, uh, for our lives as well as being important for production activities. So maybe, that w maybe your idea really is a separate paper. Yes. Um, I agree it would be a, a good one to look at. So, yeah, once again, an, another good question. Just as a, a sort of broader starting point for everyone else in the rest of the room, whether aid fosters or impedes development is something that has been studied intensively now for many decades, yeah. and we've actually come to a very conclusive answer on this. And the, the answer, it, it depends. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, but when aid is given well um, and, and given with the right intentions, there are many examples of it uh, producing very large dividends for human welfare. So, in my opinion, it's a cause worth... Uh, Supporting uh, at least supporting the, the supporting aid when it is given well and when it is given inten intelligently. With respect to your question, had we not uh, had I not got a result from the UK treatment, then that might have been a potential explanation for why uh, the treatments that I was providing weren't having any impact on people's views. And that was because perhaps people's views were first and foremost informed by their views about the efficacy of aid. However, the fact that the UK treatment was efficacious suggests to me that uh, views about the efficaciousness of aid uh, almost certainly cannot be the sole driver of people's views about whether Australia should give more or less aid. As it happens, we've also done, well, I've also conducted some cross-sectional work looking uh, at uh, uh, drawing on data from public opinion surveys where the dependent variable is supportiveness of aid and the independent variables include a variable where people are asked whether they think aid works or not. And what we do find is we find uh, some correlation between beliefs in the efficaciousness of aid and beliefs in uh, views of whether uh, aid should be increased. Um, however, the, the coefficient or the magnitude of the effect or the association is actually less than many of the other variables uh, than it is for many of the other variables that we include in our equations. So the impact of having an academic education, the impact of our political ideology, actually have a much larger impact on the probability of believing that Australia should give more aid. So I think efficacious probably, effic views about the efficaciousness of aid probably have some role in shaping people's views about whether they think Australia should give more aid, uh, but it's not an all-determining effect by any means. Archie. <coughs> um, so my question is for the second speaker, I'm sorry I've forgotten your name, because my close friend was stupid, but um, yeah. yeah um, so my background is in health, and um, so the nearest analog that I've got to the situation you described is the pricing on tobacco, and that's been found to be a very effective mechanism for um, reducing tobacco consumption. But in, um, sorry, yes, uh, oh, well, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but in recent years, the, the, the declining trend in tobacco consumption has plateaued, 
and in fact, there's some evidence that um, in fact rates are increasing. But I'm just wondering, uh, and that's probably because of some kind of acculturation to a new pricing regime and people seeing that as the new norm. Would you expect to see something similar in um, when it comes to pricing uh, of, of fossil fuels in, in, in Indonesia? In, in other words, would the intervention affect, affect eventually, eventually the price? So that's my first question. And my second question relates to the design of the study. Um, was it a, did you use a control design or how did you um, accommodate underlying temporal trends and other temporal dynamics to actually tease out the effect of your intervention? Or, or the intervention? Good questions. Uh, so the first question, um, we expect, and based on the literature as well, that the long run effect would be bigger than the short run effect. Because over the long run, there are more adaptation opportunities as well. We can move closer to our workplace, as just one example. Uh, it's possible, as you say, that the effect could disappear. But really, um, we, we think that the long run effect would be bigger. But remember as well that at the same time, there's many other things going on. The population is getting bigger, incomes are growing. So these are other things which are actually pushing up traffic growth. Uh, so our finding actually is that there are 10% vehicles, fewer vehicles on the road now than there would have been if the reform hadn't gone ahead. But still today, traffic jams are worse than ever. Right? Those two statements are, are consistent because at the same time, there are other things going on. Um, and then you asked about controls. We, uh, we don't... It was a na nationwide change in the fuel price, so it's not a nice randomised control experiment situation. But we control for a lot of other things going on and time trends and things like that. Um, and we, I can send you the paper. We do lots of other checks, but um, yeah, it's it's not. It, it isn't a shock that affected all of the roads at the same time. So it's it's a situation in which we have to include lots of controls in our statistical analysis, and it's difficult to control for everything. But we try we tried our best to do that. Okay. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, one is for Terence and one for Paul. Uh, Terence, I'm just uh, sort of uh, underscoring what Chandra asked. Is that the development literature has uh, uh, really said that if aid is effective, then at least the, the economics community is in support, is in support of it. There's a long debate. You, you've already mentioned it. So. Well, my question is, are the people uh, whom you are interviewing or for your study, do they know that aid was effective or not? Or was the question simply asked, are you in favor of more aid or are you in favor of less aid? Mm -hmm. So did you, did, you, did you tell them that, okay, in this kind of situation, aid was effective, in this kind of situation, aid was not effective? That's, that's the question to you. And for Paul, I think the, uh, the there is there is a uh, I think the analysis is uh, also needs to take into account what happens to the revenue uh, once the uh, subsidy is is lower, how the government spends the revenue, and also uh, are you sure that you said that the prices don't go up for the poor. Uh, how do you identify the poor uh, for whom the prices are not going up? So the other question. Um, so an another way perhaps of trying to uh, respond to this line of questioning is to just emphasize that these are survey experiments. There was a large sample, a thousand people, uh, run by a public opinion polling company, broadly representative of the Australian population. Uh, Knowing what I do from some of the other work that I've done, I am fairly happy um, to concede the point that probably most of the people who responded to these surveys are not abreast of the latest economic literature, so literature on aid effectiveness. Um, I don't actually hold that against them, but I think it's fair to say that a lot of our respondents would be fairly ignorant as to the real evidence about the effectiveness of aid. However, what I'm conducting here is a survey experiment and because we've got random allocation, we can more or less uh, assume that the knowledge of uh, aid efficacy is equally balanced in both the control and the treatment groups. That's why I'm confident of the efficaciousness of the UK treatment. Uh, it's something that I'm testing which is independent, I guess you might say, of the debate about whether aid works or not. But what we've found is that 
taking uh, for granted the average Australian's uh, comparative ignorance when it comes to aid, a comparison with the United Kingdom seems to have a significant impact on their support for Australia giving aid. Uh, as I said before, I think if people's views were de entirely determined by their views about uh, the efficaciousness of aid, this treatment wouldn't have worked. Um, and also, as I said in my earlier response to when we've done cross-sectional regressions where we've included beliefs about the efficaciousness of aid as an independent variable in the regressions, we find that there is a relationship between beliefs about the efficaciousness of aid and support for aid. However, the magnitude of the coefficient for that particular variable is actually less than the magnitude of the coefficients for some of the other variables that we include, including political ideology. So in terms of what shapes Australians' views about whether they support aid or not, efficaciousness is probably there but it's not uh, the sole determinant by any means. Thank you for the question, Raka. Uh, Indonesia's electricity subsidy reform program, I think, is one of the most successful, perhaps, anywhere in the world in terms of... Uh, the, previously in Indonesia, if there were large fuel price changes or electricity price changes, there tended to be protests on the streets. Uh, for this latest round and there haven't been such such protests and part of it has been due to the government strategy uh, they're on Twitter they go and are, are meeting with student groups in advance of the reforms and providing the facts to them and one very important part is that the electricity price increases have exempted the poor and how that is done in practice is all residences with the smallest electricity connection in terms of the volt ampere connection size they are all exempt from any price rise. And any house that is listed on Indonesia's list of the poor, they have a list of poor households. And you can join the list if you classify it and can prove that you are deserving to be on the list. Um, those people are also in the lowest tariff group, so they have been exempted from any price increase. Um, and you also asked about how the revenue is being used. The revenue savings are just in the general budget, they just go back to the general budget, they have allowed for some increased spending on infrastructure and some additional pro-poor spending activities as well. But, yeah, it's all just back in the budget, so it can be hard to exactly say where every single rupiah has gone. Um, in our analysis, we, we've discussed that, but, um, yeah, in general, they have been trying to spend that money in a fairly pro-poor type of way. Okay, I'm going to use the last question to ask Fiona. Fiona, does your research and modelling allow you to determine why some of your countries that you study have broken out of the so-called middle income trap and made it to that higher level of development while others tend to stay stuck in the, the kind of middle income trap levels of development? Yeah, so in, this, in the models, it's primarily when the government understands that if it fails to demonstrate accountability mm -hmm. right in that chess game and it and uh, then and, and so if it fails to do that then it, and it makes unilateral decisions then citizens do not abide by whatever policies they have and as a result it's easy for those policy policies <coughs> to fail okay so so there's a, th th there's that that's the big difference between those that succeed exactly Exactly. And, and therefore, my question to you is, would you predict that China will break out of the middle income trap? So China has a real problem because of the fact that cur their current president seems to be abandoning the accountability model. Okay. Whereas prior to that, they were starting to increase informal accountability, okay. but not under President Xi Jinping. Yes. Okay. Okay. Exciting. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Terence and Paul and Paul. <laughs> Okay, folks, we now come to our last theme, which is governance. We have uh, scholars from across the college who are working on governance issues. Um, unfortunately, one of our panellists has withdrawn at the last minute. Four and a half minutes each. Susan <laughs> Sell. <Okay. laughs> it is four and a half minutes <laughs> each. Extra time. Um, the really bad news, however, is that this is our only 
very badly gender imbalanced panel of the... Of the uh, I refuse to the, serve on a panel without another woman, actually, so. but I'd like to <laughs> to uh, gender equality. <laughs> so, we're very lucky to have uh, Tim Legrand from the Crawford School and Jeremy Uda from the Bell School. And Tim's going to start things off by talking about shared sovereignty in the Anglosphere. Marvellous. Thank you. I, I won't use the microphone, actually, okay. I, I'll use my, uh, my lecturing voice and hope that'll do the trick. Uh, good afternoon, folks. Um, so my research is concerned with the, the, the broadening processes and diverging processes of globalisation and the dilemmas that are presented by globalisation, particularly security dilemmas, to the modern state. Um, I'm, I'm riffing off Aldous Huxley's book, A Brave New World, because he looks towards the future of society and the, how technological change was going to transform the way in which humanity lived and how we bred and how society and economics functioned. And I think it's, well, it's a bit of a stretch, but it gets your attention, hopefully, that we are living in an era where the technologies of society are transforming not only the questions of governance, but the way in which governance proceeds. So the background to my research looks at how we live in an era of what I call the global local dilemma. The state is set up to preserve and pursue the public interest, the interest of you and I in a given domestic polity. We vote our, uh, for our governments on the basis that they will pursue our interests. Yet increasingly globalisation presents our politicians and our civil servants with, with annoying questions of of pursuing and achieving the public interest. That's because we see these, uh, the, the technologies of globalisation pushing forth new processes. So travel, finance, trade, communications, these things cross borders increasingly. We see the idea of, of collaboration even in academia now as not just localised to those in our corridor, but those um, in our country or even those overseas. This is propelled by particularly ICT, communication technologies, and these are technologies which, which provoke new ways of thinking about the state and how it can administer itself. In particular, we see security challenges emerge out of these dynamics. And so we ask questions like, how do we govern cyberspace? How, do we, how does the government ameliorate the threats of cyber attack emanating from sovereign entities overseas or even just criminals overseas. We ask how do we start to stop terrorism, international terrorism that derives from Middle East or from other countries. We saw in Barcelona just today the effects of an international terrorism. How does government here affect what happens over there given its implications for us today? So these are a new breed of policy and governance challenges, transnational threats. They exist and are emanate from beyond our shores, beyond the reach of our government, and yet reach into the state and affect what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So I call this the global local dilemma. And this is my research challenge that I set myself, is how do states and how have states started to rethink the way they do business to address these transnational dilemmas? I've only got one slide. So you can stare at this for the next two minutes. So my research looks at particularly one cohort of states who have a long historic and cultural relationship, what we might call in inverted commas the Anglosphere. Um, and you can see from the flags uh, which countries these are, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, UK and the United States. My research looks at how these states collectively are starting to consolidate their resources and their powers, their capabilities to resolve these transnational problems, particularly where those transnational policy problems affect the five countries collectively. Thank you for uh, is that a yeah, that would alert. <laughs> <laughs> so my research has found, identified so far, 32 networks of elite policy officials from these five countries who've consolidated their decision-making powers and their, their resources to address transnational problems. And I'm going to draw your attention to just a few of these today because I've only got a few minutes. As you can see on that bottom, we've got some emblems. These are taken directly from networks concerned with security questions. They've got their own badges. That's how 
much of identity they've assumed as transnational policy bodies. We have the Border Five who are concerned with the five countries' border protections. We see FELIG, the Five Eyes Law Enforcement Group, that's the policing agencies of the five countries. The ministers from the five countries who are represented here. So you see Jeff Sessions at one end and we see Brandis and Dutton somewhere over to the left because they're roughly equivalent roles. And they, this is them earlier this year in a meeting collaborating on, on cyber terrorism in particular. The, the question they were addressing actually was encryption and, and security. Now crucially, these arrangements are not formalised, believe it or not. They're not set in stone as a treaty or as a contract. These are actually based on memoranda of understanding, MOUs, or what I've called, um, and I quote, a non-formal grouping at official level, is how they describe themselves. These are enormously powerful and influential networks. I'll take the immigration network, the five country conference, as an example, because you may have actually already encountered this network in action. If you've used your passports to go across the border of Australia, Canada, New Zealand, UK, or the US, any time in the past five years, you would have, been, you'd have succumbed to their grand information exchange scheme, intelligence exchange, whereby travellers transiting any of the five countries' borders are visible to the other four countries. So this includes things like biometric data, your own personal individual traveller data, what, what you're carrying with you if you flag up any particular risks. It's an intelligence sharing network of the five countries' immigration network, which is unparalleled worldwide today. And they say this is to do with combating transnational policy problems like identity fraud, uh, human trafficking, people smuggling, bogus marriages, crash, cash transfer and fraudulent visa services. These are transnational collective action problems which unilaterally the countries can't resolve themselves and so they form and have formed this network to resolve them collaboratively. So why does this make a difference to what we, to society today? Well, I think that this research really starts to highlight an area of government action which is actually quite opaque. And these are informal networks. They do not report to Parliament. There's no official presence for you to go and look at and, and a website for you to explore their actions. They are an, an informal grouping. So they don't receive the, in, the oversight and the scrutiny of our parliaments and legislatures important for our transparency and understanding of how policy proceeds, that we do see how decisions are made in these networks and how they affect us as the public. And it follows from that, I think, that it gives us an insight, this research gives us an insight into how security laws are made today. They're not just predicated on our national, unilateral, domestic interest, but actually multilateral, um, collective interest across several sovereignties, or what I would call the shared sovereignty of the Anglosphere. Thank you very much indeed. Good, thank you very much. And our last speaker of the day, but certainly not least, is Jeremy Uda, who's talking to us about cops and sniffles heard around the world. Great, thank you. Thank you all for, for being here. When a disease epidemic happens, no state can handle it on its own. It necessarily requires cooperation among a variety of different governments in order to effectuate some sort of, a, of response that is going to be able to address this, this disease epidemic. Despite this fact, actually achieving that cooperation is incredibly difficult. And so what my research focuses on, on is this question of under what circumstances do we facilitate this international cooperation among governments on global health governance? Under what circumstances does it happen? And what sorts of incentives do we have in order to try to induce this sort of cooperation um, in happening? And part of the reason that, that, that I'm interested in this is looking at this building right here. And this building is actually the, the ground zero of global health governance in the 21st century. And this building is the Hotel Metropole in Hong Kong. It's a relatively unremarkable hotel, has decent uh, reviews on TripAdvisor. But the reason that this hotel is so important is that on February 21st, 2003, <coughs> Dr. Liu Jin Lun checks in because he's going to attend his nephew's uh, wedding in Hong Kong later that, that weekend. He checks in, he's been kind of busy because he's been treating cases of this atypical pneumonia in Guangdong um, that he's been seeing. Checks in, next day he starts to feel bad. 
checks into the hospital, and unfortunately he ends up dying about a week and a half later in the hospital. That's a sad story. But why does this matter? Because doctor, uh, because our good doctor here ends up being one of about 800 people who dies from and about one of about 8,000 cases of what comes to be known as SARS. And at this point, we don't actually know. When, when the doctor uh, falls ill and dies, we don't actually know what, what is important about SARS. But here's why this is so important. It's not just that his actual death. It's that on his floor, other people get sick. And these other people who get sick, they travel. And so you can see here where they travel. We can actually trace about 75% of the spread of SARS back to that one hotel room. Because other people on the floor contracted the illness, and then because of globalization and the ease of travel, they went to places like Vietnam and Singapore and Canada and Ireland and back and, and to the, the People's Republic of China, like all over the place. And so now we have a transnational global health issue, a brand new disease that we have to do something about, crossing these international borders. We need cooperation, but governments are resistant. They fear there are, that there's going to be an encroachment on their sovereignty. They fear that they're going to have trade restrictions placed on them. They fear that they're going to look weak. And so this is at the heart of, of the issues that I'm trying to, to look at. What is it that makes for cooperation to happen? in these circumstances. How can we try to encourage, excuse me, how can we try to encourage this sort of cooperation? And my research finds that we actually do have some effective carrots and sticks. We do have ways of trying to encourage this sort of cooperation um, using various, various governmental mechanisms, but also in term, by, by expanding out the range of who gets involved in these issues moving it beyond just governments and trying to get cooperation on a, a number of different levels. So that's encouraging. That, that, that gives us some reason to think that, that something positive might happen. But at the same time, bringing all of these, these actors together essentially turns us into an exercise of cat herding. We're trying to get a whole bunch of different actors at different levels with different agendas to try to come together somehow. And this is, is where we end up in that, that situation where each actor may be acting individually rationally, but for the collective good, we don't end up with a good outcome. And so this is the, 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 this is the sort of problem that, that we find ourselves in. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, when we're looking at these sorts of issues, and when we're trying to understand what's going on with this, there are two reasons that this is so important, to try to understand the, this sort of dynamic and these sorts of incentives. One has to do with the fact that we know disease epidemics are going to happen. We don't know when, we don't know where, we don't know what, but we know that future disease epidemics are going to happen. And so what we need to do is to try to put these systems in place ahead of time, and to not make these systems disease specific, but to make them overall resilient. The other reason that this is so important is because of the, the, the Trump administration. And that's because the United States historically has been the leading funder of global health governance in the world. And the, the steps that we've heard so far from the Trump administration is that there will be a reduction in that, that funding. So if there is a reduction in that funding that's available to support these sorts of global health governance systems, what we need to do is figure out, again, it's all the more important that we figure out these sorts of cooperative sorts of, of strategies that we can use so that we can prevent the next uh, SARS or the next Ebola outbreak from getting so large. So at the end, what I would say is that I'm, I find myself uh, optimistically pessimistic or pessimistically optimistic about the, the international community's ability to do these sorts of things. We do see that there are uh, these abilities. We do see that there is this sort of, of, of um, shared mindset about the importance of doing this, but we also tend to see that we don't learn very well from past experiences. And so it sometimes feels like we're reinventing the wheel each time one of these disease epidemics happen. So, like I said, we know that these disease epidemics are going to happen in the future. We know we're going to have to cooperate. The question is, what sorts of carrots and sticks do we have to try to induce that, that cooperation? Thanks. Tim, thank you. Tim, come on up here. Um, does anyone have questions? Matt? Yeah, thanks. Those are great presentations. I've got two questions for Jeremy, if I may. Sure. First, just a really naive epidemiological question. Why did that guy spread it to all around the world and all those other cases he treated in Guangdong didn't also explode outward? Uh, the second question.
question is, you're talking about organizing a global system, but isn't that kind of what the medical NGOs are already doing? Isn't that emerging organically outside the state? Sure, sure. So to, to the first question, we don't really know. Um, and that's one of the, the one of the, the issues that ha has come up is there are these these events or these, these individuals that seem to really promote the spread of a disease in the same way with the recent Ebola outbreak. We can trace about two-thirds of the, the cases to about 3% of the people who actually got sick. We don't know exactly why that is, and with SARS, it's even more uh, complicated to figure out because we haven't seen it anywhere now for 13 years. And so there's a lot that we don't know, and that actually is part of why it's so important to try to get these systems going is because a lot of times what we're facing now are these new epidemics. You know, we, we haven't seen these sorts of things before. So your, your guess is as good as mine as, as to, to, to what happened specifically with this case. Um, on the second, yes, we definitely do see some of this happening already with medical NGOs. We saw this in the response to Ebola and to a lot of the other outbreaks. But we can't necessarily rely on NGOs to take care of this. And NGOs themselves, Medicine Sans Frontier, uh, was incredible in the response to Ebola. But they said, we don't have the, ca the capacity to keep doing this. That, that fundamentally, these are things that we expect states to do to provide this sort of public health. We can, we can augment that. We can provide some of that emergency on the ground uh, assistance when the emergency emergency happens, but we can't be your actual public health system. And so I think that's where 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 the, the medical NGOs have to be a part of this conversation, but that's I think that, that's part of where the cat herding comes in, is because a lot of these systems have been very government focused and they haven't thought, well how do we bring non governmental organizations in? How do we bring philanthropic organizations or private businesses or these sorts of, of entities into the, this conversation? Because we don't really have great structures within international politics for incorporating non governmental actors into this. Robert. Thanks very much. My question is also for, uh, for Jeremy. Everyone agrees that there is very likely to be another um, major pandemic, but there is such variation in the character of pandemics mm -hmm. in terms of vectors and uh, infectiveness and incubation periods. And when we talk about being prepared, isn't the risk that we're, you know, like sometimes the soldiers being prepared to fight the last war, Aren't we just preparing to fight the last epidemic and maybe or not be prepared to fight the next one? Uh Absolutely, and that's why, why I said that one of the things that we really need to focus on is building resilience as opposed to anything that's disease specific, because you're absolutely right. If we, folk, if we put all of our energies into fighting the next Ebola uh, outbreak, we're going to miss the other things that are going to pop up, because we have no way of knowing what the next uh, outbreak is going to be. Uh, in order to try to deal with this, some of the things that have been um have received a lot of attention has been building stronger surveillance systems so we can try to identify, uh, get that information when, when a new cluster of some sort of disease pops up or something that is unexpected pops up. Uh, building these surveillance systems, but also making sure that those surveillance systems are, have a wide coverage because we don't want to have these sort of epidemiological black holes where something could foment and, and something could come to, um, uh, come to, 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 to spread rapidly. Uh, the other thing that has been looked at and has, has been debated has been to build more reserve capacity. So one of the things that you'll see now with, say, the World Health Organization is they don't actually have that many personnel. And we don't really have that many medical personnel that we could deploy at a moment's notice when something does break out so that, that we can have people that can go out to, to these sorts of places. So there's been talk about essentially having a rapid ready force of epidemiologists and public health workers on an international basis to try to, um, to, try to uh, mobilize in response to something. Again, sort of a broad sort of response as opposed to being specific to an influenza outbreak or some other disease, but also building up financial reserves so that the World Health Organization at least has, say, $100 million in the bank that they can draw on to start a response. They don't have to go out and ask everyone for money and then wait to be able to start a response until afterwards. So there, there are some efforts that are trying to, excuse me, try to get around that um, fighting that last epidemic response and trying to say, well, what can we do that would be broadly applicable in these sorts of circumstances? Fiona. I have a question for Tim. Tim, I was just curious, since you have this five um, countries in this network, um, well, clearly there is a commonality between the five, but are the, are the, is the network particularly robust given that it's informal? 
Thank you, Fiona. Um, it's a pretty stable network, it seems, across the... I mean, I've, I've, there's 32 that I've identified across government, not including the security ones. And um, the variance tends to be um, actually downwards. So there's, there's five or four or three at a minimum, um, but I think in 80% of them, it's all five countries are seated together. Actually, I tell a lie, in one network in social services, Ireland is included. And that's a network directed at um, absence parents, so parents who go overseas and don't pay their child support. So that's actually those five countries plus Ireland identify themselves as having quite a common problem because it, apparently absent parents will go to a country where they speak English. So um, the common the common denominator is the is the, the comparable economics, keep comparable cultures, language, economic development, and I think so far that has seen uh, over the. The, the networks have really emerged in the past 20 years, actually. I should have said that in my presentation. And they've stayed quite stable so far as just those, those countries. Um, do I see them growing? I think actually not um, in the foreseeable future. And I think particularly in the security networks, the reason is because they share a common security um, framework already. In the Five Eyes network, which is a, the, much more the military security-oriented networks, from that gives the artefact of shared security protocols, upon which they already they, they derive in these new networks the same protocols around secrecy and shared, what's called five eyes only, um, security classification. Which, if anyone's seen the Snowden leaks, is all over all of those documents, five eyes only. Um, and so I see them as stable for the moment. I don't see any prospect for them expanding. Thank you for your question, Terence. Well, the word, I mean, the, the research is derived out of interviews, actually. So I, I look into this through interviews with the officials, and the word they keep coming back to is trust. That, frankly, those are just, they, they collaborate with those countries. And I ask them, why not others? And they say, well, we trust each other. Like, there is an implicit trust between those five countries, which has evolved over the years, and there's institutional relationships that, that predate these networks, in which there are, you know, continual secondments between officials of these countries. So it's a very rare Australian senior official, for example, who's not had a secondment in Canada, the UK, New Zealand, the US, and vice versa. And it's a culture, I think, a cultural thing, that, that frankly these are, that there's a mutual recognition that we are like one another. Now, rightly or wrongly, you might, you know, the, the, the normative element to this is another question. You know, is this something that we want, you know, that these five countries exclude others? But certainly I think the stability that I've seen in the interview data is certainly around that idea of, we trust each other implicitly. I guess the lesson is that that's sort of international trust because it's like Alice told me that it requires a century, you know, century of civil war wars and oppression. Well, the spilled blood element certainly comes into it. That there is uh, that. I mean, the, the, the long standing Five Eyes relationship cultivates that security collaboration already, and that just spills over into this more domestic policy oriented network. Yeah, well, I mean, you can see uh, the idea of the Anglosphere, or the, 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 those who advocate for the Anglosphere, you know, they say that the sun never sets on the Anglosphere. And the, the strategic importance of that on the military alliance side was that we could eavesdrop around the world 24-7 using the network um, of five disparate countries, which actually covered the globe quite conveniently for them. So in terms of the intelligence value of that initial military collaboration, it was, it was certainly invaluable, yeah. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, I've not thought about that actually. Actually, how that affects their their relationships with other alliances and other countries. Certainly, an interesting question. One I've not thought of. Yeah. Archie. It's been a bit along the lines of what they're saying. The whole concept of the NLSB that really seems like a fairly progressive concept. Mm. I'm wondering, is there a stronger appetite for the, in, with um, with, dif- with governments of different political persuasions for this kind of thing? I mean, are conservative governments more in favour of this kind of thing than than progressive governments? Yeah, well, you look at the debate after Brexit in the UK and the Conservatives, the, 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 the pro-Brexiteers um, were pretty forthright in saying that we need to re-establish our stronger links with the Anglosphere. And so that, you know, there's, Boris Johnson was out here not long ago spruiking this idea of, well, why do we have visas between our countries? We're so similar, we're so alike. Partly it is a regressive mindset throwback to the glory days of empire for the British certainly I'm not sure the Australians see it quite that way but certainly I think that there is a um, a political edge to this which is neoconservative certainly but also it's, it's institutional you know, these are led and cemented by institutional relationships of civil servants the ministers you know come and go but civil servants who underpin these relationships stick around so in that respect it's an institutional persistence as well so I've got a question for Jeremy. So Jeremy, you, you started off with SARS in 2003, and I'm, my history's not great, but I seem to remember that bird flu and then swine flu came quite soon after that. Mm-hmm. Um, but then we don't seem, apart from Ebola, I guess, which was seen very much as a West African thing, we don't really seem to have had a pandemic, you know, a sort of broadly spreading pandemic for a while. Have the governance processes kind of started to wither away in that, that hiatus or have they been growing ever since? I mean, what's the trajectory here? Yeah, I think that I would probably call it more growing. Um, if you okay. look at it, SARS prompted a, lo- a number of reforms within the global health governance structure and within the World Health Organization. So it helped to finalize the changes to the international health regulations, which mandate which diseases governments need to report to the World Health Organization and the circumstances under which the World Health Organization can declare something called a public health emergency of international concern, which essentially says, we are really going to mobilize as many of our resources as possible. We are going to try to bring attention to this. Um, What we have seen over the... um, over the time since the, the international health regulations have, have come in is that we've seen four of these declared. So we've seen them um, around things like like, uh, like influenza. We also saw it with Zika um, oh, uh, yeah, in the, the lead up okay. to the, the, uh, the Olympics in Brazil. That was one. But then we also saw it with something like polio, which is a disease that is close to being eradicated, but they, they thought that it would make sense to um, try to make it a public health emergency of international concern to try to get that international attention to get over those last humps of where, where um, vaccination hasn't yet been able to take place for, for a variety of different reasons. Uh, and I think what is happening now is that there is a lot of going back to look at some of these regulations that, that were established in the aftermath of SARS and trying to say, okay, now that we have almost a decade Let's see what's been effective and maybe what we didn't really do all that well. So, for instance, a lot of the emphasis on surveillance came out of the, the post-SARS uh, response, but there was no money for it. So there's now a mandate that each state has to have this robust international disease surveillance system ready to go at all times and that can communicate with the World Health, or the World Health Organization 24-7. But there's no money to support that. So that's going to be, if you've got a country where just funding basic public health is already an issue, you're talking about some real challenges in terms of, uh, of the budgetary strategies. And so maybe now there needs to be some sort of funding mechanism or some sort of way of trying to promote this or looking at other sorts of ways of trying to do this surveillance. So does it need to be state-run surveillance? Can we use some other sorts of, of private actors to try to augment this or try to make sure that we have some overlapping coverage? Those are the sorts of, of issues now. So we're, we've been fortunate that we haven't necessarily had another um, another SARS level type event where we, we've got multiple countries and, and, and you know, thousands of cases of a brand new disease um, but we're still trying to figure out exactly how to make this sort of system work especially because to kind of go back to what Robert was saying we don't necessarily know what the next thing is going to be and so it's a lot of, of speculation mm-hmm. Okay Jane. Yeah I just had a follow up question about the issue of surveillance because I know like quite a time that this union had fought back against the routine spraying of disinfectants on the um, aircraft coming into to Australia from overseas because 
because a lot of people were getting allergic reactions and respiratory illnesses and this sort of thing. I mean, you know, what about the issue of human rights and, you know, um, when, you know, what do we give up when, you know, do we get sprayed, do we get monitored, you know, it, 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 you're, you're talking about from the perspective of global co cooperation and World Health Organization that it's all for the common good, but, um, you know, this is a case in which, you know, people would be disproportionately affected by this because of their jobs and that sort of thing. A absolutely, and that's sort of the, the flip side that I didn't really get a, a chance to go into is that this does raise a whole lot of, of human rights issues, and it goes back to you know Foucauldian notions of biopolitics and the role of the state in trying to to extend its reach by going into something that can look relatively benign, but the question is you know how far does this go and what sorts of, of issues are out there. Um, one of the things that they have tried to do, at least so far within the international health regulations, is to say that that states aren't supposed to impose more burdensome requirements than the WHO recommends. Um, and that's to try to get around the, the uh, imposition of, say, forced quarantines, which is, have often been used historically as, you know, used uh, for public health purposes, but oftentimes are just used as a way of getting rid of political opponents or to, to uh, replicate existing societal prejudices that, that exist. So there, there have been some efforts at that. One of the areas that um, there's been some work on, I've done a, a little bit on this, is looking at what sorts of rights people have um, to try to appeal these sorts of decisions. So, and we, again, we saw this with the Ebola outbreak where there was uh, Casey Hickox, who was one of the nurses who had been treating Ebola in West Africa, came to the United States and the governor of New Jersey tried to put her in forced quarantine even though she was expressing no symptoms and was, you know, was complying with all sorts of, of medical requirements and you know, she ended up suing the uh, state of New Jersey and eventually ended up winning. Uh, that's a, that's a, a pretty remarkable case but it's also kind of a, an extraordinary sort of circumstance. So one thing that still hasn't been worked out yet is what sorts of opportunities people would have for making some sort of appeal around these sorts of surveillance issues and how proactive this surveillance is. Is it just about, okay, well, the doctor has noticed there's been this cluster of this, this disease happening in this area. That's something that needs to be reported? Or does it need to be something that's more proactive and going out and active, actively monitoring people um, ahead of, of time? Those are some of the tensions that are still trying to be worked out. But you, you're absolutely right. This raises all sorts of human rights issues that um, that are, are, haven't necessarily been addressed uh, adequately yet. Folks, we can probably squeeze one last question in. Does anyone have any burning issues? Steve. I just, for Tim, quick uh, verification. It sounds like the finalized intelligence sharing was the first of these arrangements, and 31 others have grown up around it. That's it. Yes, the finalized arrangement uh, was established in 1956, I think. They've got a 44. 40 odd year gap um, before these domestic policy setting networks emerge. Um, and so in that hiatus, you know, there's the Cold War, and then the security collaborations you see start to pop up around you know, the emergence of international terrorism. The other <coughs> domestic ones, I think, start to pop up once you see the emergence of digital governments. So as I said, the, the technologies of globalization provoke some of these problems, but also the technology of of globalization provides the, 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 the capabilities of these networks. That intelligence sharing, information sharing um, is possible through the electronic networks that, that were invented around the late 1990s. Um, I see kind of like both of those things as sort of propelling the domestic security policy networks we see. Okay, please join me in thanking Jeremy and Tim. So folks, that's, uh, that's the showcase for today. I want to thank each and every one of the presenters who came along um, and uh, spoke about their research and uh, really admirably kept the time, I have to say. And uh, I want to thank all of you for coming along and for giving up your afternoon um, to listen and to engage and to, um, to discuss some of these issues. Um, we in CAP are looking forward to the other colleges showcases i'll certainly be going to all of them and uh and do please tell your colleagues who couldn't make it today about uh, about what you've heard about if there's anything that you think came up during in, uh, any of these presentations that you think a colleague who couldn't be here might be interested in um, do let them know and do let them know about the person who presented on that so uh what's what's left now we've got some drinks and some nibbles out in the foyer do please join us if you can 
Um, otherwise, we we'll look forward to, uh, to seeing you at the next showcase, wherever that may be. Thank you.